All right, good day, everybody. Very happy and very honored that you're uh, taking the time to join me today. Um, for the next couple hours, hopefully want to discuss some key things about becoming a firefighter. I think there's a lot of questions out there about um, how do you become a firefighter? Why do you want to become a firefighter? How do you go about becoming a firefighter? And given the challenges we're dealing with in the world right now, um, one of many being the coronavirus situation, I've decided to start giving back by doing a number of uh, shelter-in-place webinars. Um, I started back in early May um, with a couple different versions. We've done 25 reasons to hire you as a firefighter. We've also done uh, how to master the fire service testing process. Today's one is reach for the firefighter badge. Do you have what it takes to become a firefighter? And then in two weeks, on Saturday, June 20th, we'll be doing the last one in this series, 21 Key Points to Assist You in Becoming a Firefighter. A little bit of similarities in each, but of course, like anything else, there'll always be some similarities for good reason, because I think there's value to redundancy and repeating certain things. So I think there's going to definitely be some value to each of these. Uh, the last two webinars have been posted on uh, my YouTube page. Um, which is basically my name on YouTube. You can also go to my website, which I'll share here in a little bit, code3firetrain.com. You can see the links, uh, the well, as well as the link for this one, as long as this one comes out okay, um, which it should without any major technical difficulties, I'll also post this on YouTube as well too, just so you can watch it at any given time that you want to in the future. Because I know two hours is a lot to digest at one setting and you can come back multiple times, save it and do as, do as you feel fit with it. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I do want to appreciate all of you for taking the time to join me today. So without further ado, let's start out with uh, going through some of the information. And like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to save them to the very end and I'll try to capture those at the end um, as well. All right, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the fire service for almost, God, time flies. I mean, it seems like almost yesterday. <laughs> wanting to become a firefighter. Been in the fire service for over 28 years. You know, when I started the process, you know, I was still at Cal State Hayward working on my four-year degree. And a good buddy of mine, Greg Vitz, who's uh, now a um, firefighter out in the Central Valley, um, him and I had been going to college together at Cal State Hayward, working at Long Strugs together. And we'd been closet firefighters since we were little kids when we first met, God, I think in the seventh grade, sixth grade, or whatever it was. But uh, anyway, both of us started out in this path. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself, not to brag upon myself, to really, you know, sort of give some, hopefully, inspiration, some motivation, to some encouragement, because my hope is not to discourage you, not to really scare you, sound negative. My hope is to actually just sort of maybe open your eyes to the challenges of becoming a firefighter. There is no one easy way to do it. If anyone wants to tell you, well, you start here and then you end up here, it doesn't work that way. I'm going to give you a lot of suggestions, just like any other person will hopefully do around the country. So you take a little bit from me, take a little bit from the next person. You know, there's a handful of videos out there on YouTube. There's a handful of books, a lot of great resources. Do your homework. So I started out as a fire explorer with the city of Alameda Fire Department, next door to the city of Oakland. Did about a, a little over a year there as a fire explorer. Great experience to get involved, you know. Typically, explorers are 14 to 18 years old. I was obviously older than 18 since I had was just graduated college. But there's here's here's another key is learning how to go down rabbit holes. Um, because I was over 18, I want some volunteer experience. I found out that you could become what's called an associate advisor, not a supervisor, but just an associate advisor to an explorer post. Many fire departments have explorer posts, again, 14 to 18, but then they allow people over that that are over age 18 to be able to be associate advisors. Obviously, there's a firefighter, Darren Olson with Alameda Fire, doing an awesome job running the program. But you know, me and Greg both were assistants, um, associates, and it got us some experience, the resume, but we were explorers for all intents and purposes. But um, good way to get experience, never say never. From there, I was also able to become a student firefighter with the city of Oakland. It was actually a work experience program through the Chabot College Fire Technology Program, where I still teach at. It was a great program to be a student firefighter. Again, another volunteer experience piece for my resume. Did almost, God, I think 2,000 hours, which is a lot of, I mean, that's, 2,000 hours is pretty much a full-time job over the course of a year. And about a year and a half, almost two years, I think I did almost 2,000 hours. That's volunteer time of 40 plus hours a week. I was trying to do a couple shifts a week just to get experience. Great way to see some action. You know, a lot of departments don't have true volunteers, especially in the major metropolitan areas, like around the San Francisco Bay Area. 
Los Angeles area, a lot of the other big cities around the country, it's hard to find volunteer positions because most of us are paid career firefighters or fire departments. So you gotta be creative and look for opportunities. They may not say volunteer, even though they are, they may be titled differently. Um, I was also a paid call firefighter. That was actually my first paid position. Paid minimum wage, uh, I think it was like $4.50 back in the mid 90s, early 90s, but hey, it was money. It was a job, basically a full-time firefighter in many departments that works, you know, for a fire department that has three platoons or three shifts, like A shift, B shift, C shift, they typically work a 56 hour work week. Well, paid call firefighter works, I mean, they, they worked us basically nine out of 10 shifts a month, which was, I'm not complaining by any means, it was an awesome experience. So they didn't work us full-time, but they did work us full-time, meaning nine out of 10 shifts, it was still 48 hours a week, it was great. No benefits, but I got to pay into the state retirement system, which was money well spent because it still lasts um, up to today and is in my state retirement system bank, which is awesome. But I would share these things because you're not required to have these things. Most departments don't require you to have any volunteer experience, but they definitely help you. I mean, they help expose you, they help encourage you, help give you some resources. And they help basically just maybe help you pave the way for your future. My first full-time career position was back in 95. And that took me about four and a half years to get that position, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But after about four and a half years of testing, about 50 plus fire departments around the state, around the Bay Area, I finally got my first full-time paid job. The first part-time paid job with Elk Grove took about a little over two years. First full-time was about four and a half years. And before you say, God, you're a loser, Steve, We'll talk about that. Maybe I am, I guess. Maybe I should have been hired sooner, but hey, I was hired. What's the difference? Some people give up and, you know, they never get the opportunity. So I was hired down here in Santa Clara County, where I'm still at. I was then uh, promoted after about five years working as a firefighter engineer paramedic to captain, which I did about five, six years as a captain. From there, I then spent about five, six years as a battalion chief supervising a number of firehouses. And then from there, I was promoted to deputy chief back in 2011, and I'm still a deputy chief nine years later, which is a great position. Um, started out as the training deputy chief, then did some time as the administration deputy chief, did some time as the operations division deputy chief, and then now I'm back overseeing the training division. Awesome experience. You know, don't get me wrong. I loved riding backwards in a fire engine. I loved driving a fire engine as an engineer. I loved being the captain riding shotgun. I love being a battalion chief in a buggy. But you know what? I love being a deputy chief as well too. Rank is not about everything. I used to think I had to be a fire chief to make positive change. Think about that. I used to think I had to be the fire chief to make positive change. I learned after a while that was a very naive thought that I had because some of the best change in the fire service comes at the lowest ranks the firefighter ranks, the engineer ranks, the captain ranks, the battalion chief ranks. Now, as a deputy chief or as a battalion chief or even as a captain, we're here to obviously support our crews so they can give the best possible service they can to the community. Now, like I said, some of the best change comes from the lower ranks. So don't think you have to be the top or even be a chief or even a captain to make positive change and or be a leader because leadership comes and falls within every rank. So keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, a little more, more about myself. I'm fortunate to be the author of three different books, two of them on firefighter career preparation, which I'll share here shortly, another one on promotional preparation, and I've got two more being finalized, one on promotional preparation, and then another one on leadership. I just really have a passion, hopefully, that you'll see today, and with my other webinars, I'm just helping people in so many different ways. I really help people, enjoy, enjoy helping people you know, get hired, help them stay hired, help people get promoted and also stay promoted. You know, it's just really enjoy being able to pay it forward as I'm doing right now, um, give back as I'm doing right now, and really help mentor and train the future of the fire service, as well as the current fire service leaders. Um, been fortunate to have over 200 articles published in all the major fire magazines, fire engineering, firehouse, fire rescue, and a whole slew of others. All of them are pretty much available. If you do a Google search or off my website, which I'll share here shortly, I've put links to all them. Um, like I said, besides being a firefighter for over 28 years, I've also been an instructor the entire time. I've always had a passion, as you can hopefully see, as I've shared already, about you know helping others and teaching, speaking. I enjoy doing that. I Right now, 
as of next year, I'll have taught in 33 states throughout the United States. Um, I've got a lot of classes that were obviously scheduled for the spring that have been pushed into later this year or early next year, where I get to go to fire departments across the country and, you know, have a good discussion on leadership, officer development, or even promotional preparation. So entry level um, is obviously a passion as our firefighters are currently on the job, regardless of their rank. So I enjoy getting out there and uh, going wherever someone wants to hear me. Um, also teach part-time at the Chabot College Fire Technology Program. Um, run their website, ChabotFire.com. And you know I really enjoy being able to connect with the college students as well there to the future of the firefighters. I mean, it's awesome to be able to do that. And then I've also been an oral board rater and proctor for thousands of candidates. I mean, entry level candidates, engineer promotion, captain promotion, chief officer promotions. I've been on both sides of the panel. I've been obviously a candidate, like I shared, taking over 50 tests to become a firefighter, but then I had to go through tests to become a captain, to become a battalion chief, and become a deputy chief. And I've also had the chance as a deputy chief of training and deputy chief of administration to be able to help proctor as well as help be a part of developing some of the tests for all ranks of candidates. So really enjoy doing that. Then I've also, as you know, hopefully you can see, I've mentored countless individuals to either get hired or get promoted all the way up to fire chief. So again, that's a passion. That's something I enjoy doing. And hopefully this is not a one and done. Hopefully our paths will, you know, continue to cross at some point after this webinar for years to come. That's why I enjoy being involved, not just with entry level, but also promotional preparation as well. So these webinars I'm doing are based on two of the entry-level preparation books I published a few years ago, the Future Firefighters Preparation Guide, as well as Reach for the Firefighter Badge. They're both different and they complement each other. They have a lot of good information, I think, that will help anybody regardless of what part of the country you're in. So don't think, well, I'm in Ohio, or I'm in Florida, or I'm in Canada, or Timbuktu, wherever that is. I'm not in California like Steve is. You know what? The information to become a firefighter or get promoted is not that drastically different from across the country, whether you're here in California, back east to New York, up in North Dakota, down in Texas. Most departments actually do the exact same things or very similar things when it comes to hiring people and also promoting people. It's not rocket science, but it's a lot of similar information. My goals. My goals of this webinar, as, as with anything else I do, my goals are to hopefully inspire you not just to be the best that you can be, but inspire you to hopefully take this and take it further. Um, the badge does not drop from the sky. I, I jokingly say that because a lot of think, people think they hold their hands out and the badge is just gonna come from the ceiling or from the sky. You gotta work your butt off to become a firefighter. Sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's timing, sometimes it's opportunity, and sometimes it's one of those meeting each other. And sometimes it doesn't happen at all, but usually when it doesn't happen at all, it's usually because of something maybe that you could have done differently, like continue the process. I mean, I've known many people that gave up after, you know, I ask them, hey, you know, why did you, you know, stop becoming a firefighter? Oh, because of whatever reason. I got sick of the process, so they weren't hiring. And then of course, how many tests did you take? And I usually hear, well, I took like five tests and I gave up after five tests. Okay, if you expect to get hired after five tests, now think about this, if you've been involved with taking a firefighter examination for any fire department across the country, it's usually not you by yourself. It's usually you and double digits, if not triple digits, if not thousands of individuals, especially for the bigger cities like New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, they get thousands of applicants. Yeah, they may hire a couple hundred people over the course of a couple of years of that list being available. So you can't say, well, I didn't get hired. Yeah. Okay. You're one of 10,000 that took, say, San Francisco's test. Yeah, they hired maybe 300 off the list over the course of five years or so. But, okay, 500 got hired. How many thousands did not get hired? I mean, and so you can't look at it that way. So I'm hoping to inspire you because leadership, which all of you are leaders, all of you have the potential to be leaders regardless of your current rank or your future rank. Leadership comes with regardless of rank. So much about getting hired and being a good successful firefighter or any rank in the fire service is positivity. Glass is half full or is it half empty? I'm a half full type of person. Many of course are half empty. I mean, you look at what's going on in today's world, it's so easy and sometimes it's easy to get wrapped around the axle with social media and all the other outlets that are sharing information with us 
regardless of which way it's slanted or whoever's writing it, you know, it's so easy to get negative. And again, we don't want negative people. We want positive people. And we'll talk about that. So I want to hopefully inspire you, keep you positive, keep you motivated. I want to inform you about sometimes some best practices. Again, just sharing my opinion. That's all they are. Good, bad, or indifferent. I want to educate you on certain things. And again, some of this stuff may be repeating stuff that you already know, and that's fine. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to go back over information that you already know. Maybe because you hear things maybe differently from me than you heard about from the next person. Because three people could talk about the same subject, but maybe give you their own little spin on it. I mean, I'm not trying to share fake news or anything else. I'm trying to provide realistic news. But, you know, bear with me on that. I'm also here to hopefully encourage you to go to ra down rabbit holes. And what I mean by rabbit holes are with the things that I share today, I'm hoping that, number one, you're taking a lot of good notes and just maybe something I say, something I do, something that's written down on the screen maybe causes you to write a note and say, I got to go visit that website. Or maybe I got to go Google that term because I've never heard that term before. So that's what I hope to do because usually when you do things like that, it usually leads to something else. And then from there, I mean, hopefully it's a good process for you to continuously educate yourself and become a better candidate and ultimately get hired. I want to share my passion as I've been discussing already. And as I shared, I want to pay it forward, hoping you do the same. Now you may go, Steve, I'm not even on the job yet. How am I going to pay it forward? Well, even if you are not on the job, but even if you are, there may be some of you that are on the job already that will watch this now or in the future because maybe, they, maybe you're unhappy in your current fire department and you want to move somewhere else. Well, I know a lot of firefighters that are on the job in certain departments across the country that you know, are looking for joining other fire departments, which is normal. I mean, the grass sometimes is greener on the other side. Sometimes, sometimes not. Well, that's tough when you've already been on the job. And I don't want you to be, and let me, I get off in rabbit holes, as you can tell. When I was testing to become a firefighter, I'd go to firefighter exams and I, you know, start talking with people, introducing myself. Hey, I'm Steve. Nice to meet you. You know, where are you from? You know, what do you do and everything else? Just trying to do small talk, build relationships that we'll talk about in a little while. It was very intimidating, at least for me as a pre-service entry level wannabe firefighter, you know, testing to hear somebody else go, oh yeah, I work for XYZ Fire Department. As a full-time firefighter, my eyes would open up. I mean, I remember going to one department, one guy goes, yeah, I worked for the San Francisco Fire Department for the last seven years. And I'm like, oh my God, this dude's my competition. But then it took a while for me to sink in. I'm like, well, I should have asked him the question, what do you not like about San Francisco? Why do you want to leave San Francisco? I mean, there probably is a good reason, but I should have asked the question. But then on the flip side, I shouldn't have really been worried about him because I'm not competing against that person. I'm competing against myself. And I think that's what people got to realize is don't be intimidated by the others. Or when you're taking a written test or you're going somewhere and you see all these, you know, guys, well, he's a volunteer, she's a volunteer, oh, he's a paid firefighter, she's a paid firefighter for that department, they got their, you know, fire department billboard shirts on. Don't be intimidated by that. Don't worry about them, worry about yourself. So when I say pay it forward, I was in your shoes 28 years ago, give or take. Even at that time when I was wanting to become a firefighter, going to college to become a firefighter, working as an explorer firefighter, working as a paid call firefighter, a student firefighter, whatever, I was already thinking in the future to today. I mean, granted, obviously, I wouldn't have expected 2020 to be like it is today for so many reasons, but where I'm at sitting in my position today, whether it's being a chief officer, whether it's teaching at the college, whether it's being able to write articles, whether it's able to share my passion with others like I'm doing right now, that was not something that I just thought of yesterday. It's something I've always wanted to do. Now, you're not me and I'm not you, but again, I'm hoping to encourage and inspire you because when I was sitting there, you know, like in your position, I was putting everything in my brain of, okay, when I'm in that position of firefighter, what do I want to be? Where do I want to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now? And that should be paying it forward, hoping you do the same. The last thing is, look at this picture. This is a group of Academy graduates. These are graduates that were hired by the fire department, meaning they passed all the phases of the process. The last couple of webinars I've touched on the phases of a hiring process. Typically, you don't just walk, knock on a door to a firehouse and say, hey, I want to ride Big Red. 
join the club and join the long line of people that want to do that. Usually when you want to become a firefighter, there's multiple steps in the process. Fill out an application, take a written test, physical ability test, oral interview, chief's oral, background investigation, psychological evaluation, medical evaluation. Oh yeah, by the way, that stuff could all take a few months, if not half a year, full year. By the way, you have to go through the Recruit Academy. Now they're gonna put you through the Recruit Academy, which could be a couple weeks, couple months, up to six months, depending on the department. Then you get to raise your hand typically after the Academy, and this is usually about a year or more after you sign the dotted line on your job application that you submitted to that department to work. You're taking that oath of office to serve, to protect, to do the right thing, to help your community, to give back. Don't ever forget that day because It'll seem like yesterday, which it did for me back in 1995, when I became a full-time firefighter, but it's, it goes by quick. So it's saving the moments. Understand why you're getting into this process, and that's what we'll touch on here shortly. I joked about taking notes, not joking about taking notes. I mentioned about taking notes. I encourage you to take notes and hopefully go down rabbit holes. And the word entitlement is thrown out a lot. And I know a lot of younger folks get, I think, falsely accused of being entitled. When I say younger folks, by now we all realize there's different generations. All of us, each, based on our age bracket, falls into a different age um, generation. You know, generation X, Y, Z, millennials, whatever it is, whatever the term is. I think that's unfair to categorize younger folks as being entitled because I think in today's world, everyone seems entitled. I see people very young to very old that sound entitled for whatever reason. So all I got to say on that is hopefully you're not entitled. Hopefully you realize that anything worth having in life takes a lot of hard work, timing, opportunity, as I mentioned earlier. You know, you, very rarely does someone get hired on their first test. Very rarely does someone get promoted on the first time they take their promotional exam. You know, very rarely does someone get married, say, the first time they meet their significant other. I mean, that's just reality, and that's okay. With hard work usually comes good things, usually. So take good notes, and again, I'm a resource for all of you. My websites, and again, I'll share my contact information at the very end, but for right now, I run two websites. My personal website for folks that are already on the job, as, um, that are looking to become better leaders, that are looking for training information, promotional preparation information, leadership information, code3firetraining.com. Um, I have a free stuff link there that has a lot of free stuff on there. And if, even if you're not on the job yet and you want to be a firefighter, there's a lot of good information because one of the nuggets about becoming a firefighter, I'll let you in on one of the secrets. One of the nuggets about becoming a firefighter is don't just prepare for the test. Listen, don't just prepare for the test, meaning the written test, the oral interview, prepare for the position, prepare for the job, prepare for the career. So yes, prepare for the position, the career, the job. And how do you do that? By learning what a firefighter does. So there's a lot of things that you can be doing now to educate yourself what a firefighter does um, because that will help you with all the phases of the hiring process. Doesn't mean that you have to understand the pro um, position but it sure helps. So Code 3 Fire Training is my one website. My other one that I run for the Chabot College Fire Technology Program is ChabotFire.com with a lot of entry-level preparation information there. Both of them have free stuff links. Both of them have hundreds of articles for all ranks of people, from fire chief down to firefighter. I try to cover it all with a lot of information there. So when people say, what do I do to become a firefighter, Steve? I usually say, go to ChabotFire.com. Look on the homepage. There's a section on there, so you want to become a firefighter. And from there, there's like a 15, 20 page brochure, a roadmap I put together about becoming a firefighter with a lot of links to rabbit holes and other things to encourage you to do. So between the free stuff link and between the, so you wanna become a firefighter section, you got hours and days to keep yourself busy. So hopefully that's helpful in some way. Now, my disclaimer, I shared this a little bit earlier. There may be some redundancy on all sessions, but that's done for a purpose. Like at Chabot College, I teach the intro class. If you've ever taken an intro class to any subject, I teach intro to fire. Well, the intro to fire is a 50 to 60 hour semester class, like all semester classes are typically 50 to 60 hours, but it's sort of a introduction class. It sort of is there to inspire, encourage, motivate, as I shared earlier, and it's there to cover each of the topics. Like to get a fire technology or fire science degree at any college, for example, there's a lot of core classes. Core classes, meaning 
fire behavior, building construction, firefighter safety, maybe wildland, fire prevention, fire equipment and systems. There's all these little subjects that are part of the overall degree. Well, the introduction class is just there to give maybe 20 minutes on building construction one day, maybe 30 minutes on fire behavior the next session, maybe 30 minutes on fire prevention, 40 minutes on firefighter safety. And a lot of students go, well, you're repeating all the same things. No, I'm giving you the highlights of what you're gonna get because when you take that semester long class of say building construction or firefighter safety or fire behavior, you're gonna get 50 to 60 hours just in that one topic. I'm just giving you a little highlight of the key points just to wet your whistle and get you an idea of what you're getting into. So try to look at it that way. Um, I initially did a session on May 9th with the same title. It didn't get up to YouTube because of some technical difficulties. So if you did watch that one, thank you very much. But there's going to be some slight variations to this one. And obviously, um, redundancy isn't a bad thing there, too. But this is the one that will actually make YouTube, um, assuming no further technical difficulties. So let's leave it at that. All right. My agenda, and everyone's got an agenda, trust me. Hopefully, your agenda is for good and for positive. My agenda is to talk about some lessons learned today, primarily myself and also some others. Not here to throw stones, Monday morning quarterback, but I'm here to open some eyes to see what you're getting into. And again, learn from my experiences, both good and bad. Um, I want to talk about current status of fire departments hiring. I want to talk about do you have what it takes to become a firefighter? Some people think they could be a firefighter. Maybe you don't have what it takes. You know, it's easy to throw stones at something. It's easy to talk crap about a job you're not currently doing. Um, but until you've walked in those shoes, how do you understand what that job is? So, you know, it's like a firefighter that makes fun of a fire chief or a firefighter that says, hey, if I was fire chief, I'd be doing it this way or I'd be doing it that way. And why is the fire chief doing this? Well, in most departments, the fire chief was a firefighter because that fire chief took the time to go from firefighter to captain to chief officer, maybe battalion chief, deputy chief up to fire chief. Whereas a firefighter hasn't promoted and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But at least that fire chief has walked in the firefighter's shoes where the firefighter has not walked in the fire chief's shoes. And they're two different jobs. Same core mission, obviously, serving the community, serving the public, serving the department. But until you've walked in someone's shoes, it's hard to really understand what that person actually has to go through. I want to talk about networking and building relationships because I think that's critical to your success, not just to become a firefighter, but also stay a firefighter and just as a good human being. We'll talk about some other career opportunities within the fire service that are out there. And then we'll do some Q&A. So if you have any questions, like I mentioned, please save them to the very end. Or feel free to email me after the fact, text me, whatever. And I'll share my contact information at the end. So some of my lessons learned. Let's get into making fun of Steve here. And I say making fun of Steve because, you know what? I don't walk on water. I'm not perfect. And I want you to learn some from, from some of my mistakes. Now, some of you, when you're starting out, may go, God, four and a half years to get hired full time. What a loser. Big capital L. I thought that way. But then after being on the job full time for 25 years, yeah, I've been in, in the service for over 28 years, but full time, 25 years going on. Call me what you want. I'm on the job. I've got a career. I'm happy. I'm very fortunate. Not everyone that starts to become a firefighter becomes a firefighter. So was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it without a doubt. Would I do it again? Yeah, without a doubt. But there's some of you that may be watching this that go four and a half years. Oh, heck no, I ain't going to do that. That's just impossible. Well, maybe in today's entitlement world, and again, I'm not any, not talking or knocking any specific age range or any generation, but in today's world, everyone wants things fast, wants things now. I mean, I know that because I get emails all the time from people that want to, you know, since I run the website for the college, I get emails that are like, hey, what's the fastest way to become a firefighter? I, I mean, I get that a lot. Or I want the fast track. And I usually respond back with, there is none. And sometimes that pisses people off. I want the fast track. And my answer usually is, okay, if you're expecting me to send you an email, or excuse me, reply to an email in a paragraph or a page or two to tell you everything you need to know about becoming a firefighter, you're pretty clueless. And really, that's no different from any type of job. Whether you want to work in government in general, whether you want to be a police officer, whether you want to be an elected official, whether you want to be a professional athlete, whether you want to be a medical professional, 
healthcare professional, a doctor, lawyer, mechanic, working in the trades. You don't just walk down, fill out the application and say, all right, you're hired. It doesn't typically work that way. So getting hired takes a lot of learning about what you're getting into. So yeah, there are, you're gonna meet some people out there. Trust me, you will probably meet some people that are already working as firefighters in your travels, which I encourage you to hopefully meet as many fire professionals as you can. Fire chief all the way down to firefighter. Don't, don't discriminate based on rank. Meet as many as you can in your local fire department and neighboring fire departments through your friends, your family members. Pick their brains, get their opinions. Everyone's got a good opinion. Just try to pick through what's realistic and not. If anyone tells you there's a fast track, don't believe them. And those students, like I said, are wannabe students. When I say there is no fast track, they get pissed off. And sometimes they go, well, I'm getting old or I'm getting to be, you know, my early 30s. The clock is ticking or I'm out of work and my family I got to feed for, provide for. Okay, there is no fast track. Let's just stop right there. There is no one way to do it. Like I shared earlier, what I usually tell those students is go to the Schmo Fire website, regardless of where you're from in the country. I don't care if you ever go to Schmo College, our program. It's called free stuff for a reason. Go check the information out. It's beneficial. I usually tell them, like I shared earlier, go click on the link so you want to become a firefighter. That'll keep you busy for a number of hours. And then usually I'll get an email back saying within like a half hour, yeah, I read that. But and then of course, I, I read all the information on the website and now I want to know, please help me. How do I do this? Or how do I do this? And I'm thinking to myself, you're BSing me because there's no way you covered everything on the website in that small amount of time. Bullshit. Yeah. And I usually point them back, go back, read the brochure. It also shares a lot of links like the free stuff link. And again, there is no fast track. You don't have to go to college. You don't even have to have a four year degree, a two year degree. It, many departments are hiring people with a high school diploma or a GED. I mean, granted, a lot of people with four year degrees and two year degrees are getting hired and higher degrees but it doesn't require you. I don't know of a department out there that requires a two or four year degree because it limits their applicant pool. So you don't have to be anything more than usually a high school graduate or have a GED and or be 18 years old to get hired. Now I know your odds are slim and you better be damn good on that oral interview because the oral interview is usually 100% of your score in most departments. The other parts are usually pass fail. You better have some damn good charisma, excellent personality that connects with others. You gotta have something good to offer. But people do get hired with, you know, 18 years old, fresh out of high school with nothing on their resume. But again, usually that's not just a random hiring. Sometimes it can be, I get it. But four and a half years, it was worth it. There's some of you that go 50 plus tests, Steve. Hey, I know guys that took a hundred plus tests to get hired. And there's people that go hundred plus tests, I would never do that. <laughs> Okay, then guess what? That guy that I know that took 100 plus tests and did get hired, it took him like 10 plus years, more than four and a half years. Guess what? His title is, you know, John Smith, firefighter, regardless of where he works at. He's got the job because he didn't give up. He had the tenacity, the persistence to stick it out. And I think that's the key is you got to be in this for the long haul. So knowing what you're getting into is critical. Could I have been hired without my four-year degree, without my two-year degree? And all I did within the four and a half years, I already had my four-year degree from Chabot College, excuse me, Cal State Hayward, had my two-year degree in fire technology from Chabot, had my EMT, a firefighter academy at the college as well too, and I also was a paramedic with some volunteer time as I shared earlier. Did all those things hurt me? Oh no. Do they help me? Yeah. But as I mentioned a little while ago, the oral interview is usually 100% of your score. I was good at oral interviews. I enjoy talking, go figure, as you can tell now, probably. I don't mind the talking. You know, I was doing good in oral interviews, but the challenging part is just trying to make sure that you stick it out to find that one department that is a good match, a good fit, as they call it, for you. That's why if you're ready to give up after five or 10 tests, the problem is probably you, not them. Um, and maybe it is a them problem because maybe it's the sheer numbers. If you took five tests where thousands of people tested alongside you and they only hired like a total of 10 people, then you know what? I mean, hey, there's like, what, 1% of the people that took the test are happy and you're one of the 99% that didn't get hired. I mean, there's going to be some unhappy people. So you got to be in this full time living, sleeping, eating this process, but it's definitely worth it. Now, 
as I shared, 50 plus tests. Now, I'll be honest, some of those tests, about 20 of them were actually lotteries or random lotteries as some departments do. You may go, why does a department do a random lottery? Well, I shared, if your department, your local department gets 5,000 applications for three positions, let's say they wanna hire three positions and they got 5,000 applications, there is no way in hell they're gonna I mean, they'll process the applications because that's pretty easy. To, well, it's not easy to do. It's challenging still processing an application. But to host that many people for written tests or especially that many people for an oral interview, ain't no way it's going to happen. You know, it's not, not going to happen. So random lottery is a, you know, good, bad, or different. It's what some departments have to do to be able to at least lower the numbers. Yeah, it's random. And you may be missing out on great quality candidates. I totally get that. But again, a department, there's no way they can, well, the only way I've seen departments that can interview thousands of people, one of my first tests at the city of San Jose, they were doing that. They were interviewing thousands of people. Well, think about this. Consider this. I walked in. Let's say my appointment was 8 o'clock for my interview. I thought, okay, I'm ready to do my first interview at the city of San Jose here. And there was like 20 other people with me. We're all in this bullpen area at the convention center. Every half hour or whatever it was, there was like 20 people going into the different rooms. There was like 20 different rooms set up. It was like, okay, Mr. Przbrowski, you're in room number one. Mr. Jones, you're in room two. Ms. Smith, you're in room three. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you're in room seven. Okay, you know, Mr. Jones, room 20 around the corner. I mean, they were interviewing. It was like a cattle call. And I, I mean, they didn't have to do a random lottery, but it was frustrating because they had like 20 different oral board panels and that's not uncommon, but here's the challenge. I could be smoking that one oral interview panel in front of me because maybe those two, three, four people, which are most commonly you'll find two, three or four in an oral board. Maybe I connect with those people in the 30 minutes I'm in the room. Well, what's to say that I didn't get say assigned to room three. Maybe I was assigned to room three, which are different people. Well, they could have hated me. So it really was luck of the draw, depending on which panel you got, depending on their mood for the day versus a lot of departments. That's why they have to do random lotteries because they don't vary the raters. They just have the same two, three or four people that see all the candidates. Well, in my department, that actually works pretty good because the oral board, that's about two weeks to see about 150 candidates, give or take. That's a long time to be on an oral board. I mean, not for you, the candidate, because you're in and out in a half hour, but for the oral board, that's Monday through Friday, eight to five for two freaking weeks. It's fun, it's exciting, trust me, for the first day. And then by the second day, the third day, it's like, oh my God, we got another week of this. And we all do our best to try to have a smile on our face and to be encouraging because we know we should be giving everybody the best possible experience, whether you're the first candidate on the first Monday or the last candidate on the last day of the second week. That's what most oral boards are there for, but it's tough. So again, 20 or so random lotteries, and I was 0 for 20 on random lotteries, so I guess it wasn't too random if I was 0 for 20, but that's, hey, but here's the thing. I could be bitter about it. I could, could have given up about it. No, okay, I'll, thank you very much. I'll take the next one and I'll come back again. I realized early on that you didn't need anything to be hired in most departments, high school diploma, GED, or 18 years old. Well, if you do the research on what departments are requiring to get hired, a lot of departments require EMT or paramedic. EMT, some departments will put you through EMT. Very few will put you through paramedic, but a lot of departments require EMT. Some require firefighter one through a college um, or maybe having some volunteer experience with their department, for example. It's not uncommon for some bigger departments that have volunteer programs or they call them reserve programs to try to give preferential treatment for those folks that are within their systems maybe as a reserve, a volunteer, a cadet, an auxiliary, an explorer, whatever they call it. But within those systems, they also usually provide firefighter one training. Um, even if a department doesn't require those things, it definitely helps increase your odds and allows you to take more tests. Because when you start seeing who's testing out there and the requirements, you're going to realize, oh, if I want to work in a certain area, which I wanted to work in the Bay Area, I was born and raised here. Well, back in the early 90s, most departments requiring EMT, a handful of firefighter one through, an, through a college academy. But in the early 90s, a lot of departments were starting to require a paramedic. The writing was on the wall because all these departments in the San Francisco Bay Area were starting to become ALS, advanced life support. 
And that was the writing on the wall when I'd go, you know, talk to firefighters at firehouses, like, hey, I'm testing to become a firefighter. And they're all like, get your EMT, get your firefighter one, become a paramedic. I'm like, okay, which definitely increases your odds because there's less paramedics out there. But I focused too hard on filling the resume. My resume when I started out was a blank. This is a blank piece of paper. It may be hard to see, but my resume at first was blank like everyone else's is. And I had a 40 degree on there and I had some work experience at the Long's Drug Store, but here I am competing with all these others that wear their fire department shirts. They talk about all their volunteer, their paid experience. It was intimidating as I shared earlier. You know what? We don't hire resumes, we hire people. And I think that's the key that now I realize on the other side of the panel, meaning on the fire department side, making choices of who's gonna be able to become a good firefighter, who's gonna be a good fit for our department, for our community. That I think is the key. It's good to have things on your resume, don't get me wrong, but don't feel intimidated by not having things. I mean, if a department requires EMT or paramedic or firefighter one academy and you don't have those, well, you probably need to get those if that's where you wanna work. But like I said, there's opportunities out there, but don't focus on the resume, have a resume, but focus on you, meaning selling yourself, marketing yourself, branding yourself, not like a salesperson, but you are a salesperson. Because you're going to get into that interview for that time frame. Some interviews could be as little as eight minutes. I've had, I remember the city of um, Daly City, just south of San Francisco, Daly City back in like 92, 93. It was an eight minute interview, four questions, eight minutes. It was, I mean, that's two minutes a question, max. They were pumping out candidates every 10 minutes, meaning one candidate at eight o'clock, the next one at 810, 820, 8.30. So, the poor candidate had eight minutes in the room, and then there was two minutes for the Raiders to be able to quickly score the candidate, and then of course, next one in. I felt for those individuals because here they are making a, making a career decision because here they are in eight minutes or less trying to decide, okay, we wanna hire him, we wanna hire her, oh, we don't wanna hire him, we don't wanna hire her, oh, we wanna hire, that's stressful. Yeah, it may be as little as eight minutes, it may be as much as 30 minutes for your oral interview, and that's a career decision that they're making on you. So you gotta be a good communicator, you gotta be able to sell yourself and be able to market yourself, but again, not like a slimy salesperson. I don't wanna say any industry, but I couldn't do sales, and I appreciate those that are in sales to help feed their family and provide their families, but. I couldn't do that because it's hard for me to try to push things on people, especially if they don't need them. But you got to sell yourself. You can't be the quiet, shy, per shy person that just sort of sits there and, yeah, I'm Steve. I, I want to be a firefighter to help people and give back and just serve my community. You're not going to get the job with something as boring and robotic and monotone as that. So you got to focus on the characteristic traits, and we'll talk about those. I shared about being in it for the long haul. Four and a half years, yeah. I was ready to give up, throwing the towel many times, as are many people. But you know what? I didn't. And I think that's the key. So when you start talking to other people, especially disgruntled wannabe firefighters, which you're going to run into, especially if you're in this long enough, you're going to hear those people of, oh, why are you wasting your time becoming a firefighter? They're not hiring right now. Or they don't hire your kind. I hate that when people say your kind. What is your kind? Whatever that is. You know, I remember my neighbor across the street years ago, it's like, well, I gave up. He since moved on, but he, I remember him saying years ago, like, well, I gave up. I go, how many tests do you take, dude? He's like, I gave, I took like five tests. I'm like, you gave up after five tests? And I'm thinking, the guy had job offers. I go, well, how did you rank on the, on the list? I mean, you took five tests, how'd you rank on the list? I was, you know, trying to throw him a bone. He goes, well, I didn't make any hiring lists. You know, I go, what do you mean you didn't make any hiring lists? He goes, well, I couldn't pass the oral interview or I couldn't pass, you know, the written test or whatever. He goes, I smoked the physical ability test. I was rocking him. You know, I was in shape. And I'm like, dude, okay, if you can't pass a written test and you can't pass, a, you know, an oral interview, how do you expect to be a firefighter? Obviously, the problem was probably more on his end than the department's end because it ain't the department's fault if you can't pass a written test past the oral interview or whatever else. So I think he had a lot of bitterness and a lot of inside issues, which a lot of people do. I get it, It's especially now in today's world, it's very human nature to be bitter and be negative and blame others. Don't be that person. So he was just like, whatever. He goes, he goes I gave up because they didn't hire white guys. And I'm going, well, that sounds sort of racist to say that because I'm like thinking to myself, I, I got hired and I don't think I got hired because of my skin color or because, I, I mean, 
I got hired because of what I sold the department, what I sold the department on my resume, but more importantly in person during my oral interview. Because the department is looking at you, a candidate, it's a long-term investment. They're looking on someone that they're gonna hopefully have on board for 20, 30, 40 years. They're gonna put a lot of money into outfitting you with uniforms, personal protective equipment. They're gonna put a lot of money into training you. They're gonna put a lot of money into not just evaluating whether you're a good candidate, but to spend on their, you the rest of your career, whether it's your pension they're paying into, their, your benefits, your salary. That's a lot of money a department's gonna spend on someone and they wanna make sure they're doing it for the right reasons. So hire for fit, hire for character. So if you have a trouble with understanding what hire for character is, do a Google search on character traits, positive character traits. Well, understand good and bad ones too, but those are the things that most departments are looking for. They're, I mean, don't get me wrong, some departments may be looking for, well, we want a four-year degree, we want a paramedic, we want someone with a lot of experience on the job. I get it, but that's not most departments. Most departments, again, want to hire good quality people, good people that are nice, good people that have an understanding of what civil servant service is, they understand community service, they understand um, serving others in their time of need. Because when someone calls 911, they ain't doing it because they want to say hi to us. Typically, it's their worst day ever. I mean, I know a lot of our calls are not 911 life-threatening emergencies, but you know what? It's still someone having a bad day for whatever reason. And we're there to try to make it better for them. So we want to hire good people, good positive attitudes. So don't get me wrong. It's good to go to school. It's good to get your EMT, your firefighter one, if you have the ability to do that in your area, but maybe you don't. Maybe you live in an area that you can't afford to leave your job, leave your family. Okay, that's okay, but maybe there's a way to get your EMT somehow, some way, I don't know. Maybe there's a way to get your online schooling. I'm not a fan of online schooling, but that's just me. But it's not, it's not for everybody, it's for some, but not for everybody. And you may still have to go in person and do your skills, but if you live in the middle of nowhere, that may be your best option. But anyway, positivity is what we're looking for in so many things. Um, sometimes you may have to step back to step ahead. Just in, what that means in a nutshell is you don't just start out on the ground floor or the bottom rung of any ladder and go right to the top. I mean, it's, there's going to be a lot of road rash. There's going to be a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. Very few people apply and get their first job off forever. I mean, it happens. And I've heard people, yeah, that was the only test I ever took and I got hired. It's like, wow, that's, that's better odds than winning the lottery. It happens, but it doesn't usually happen. So getting to step, take a step backwards. I was working full-time at Long's Drug Stores. Like I said, I had finished Cal State Hayward, got my 40 degree. I was working in a management position. Yeah, I worked full-time in a management position for a drugstore, retail drug chain similar to CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid now. I was also going to school full-time on my four-year degree. Yeah, it can be done. Thankfully, I was single. And I didn't have a lot of, you know, um, issues that I had to worry about family-wise, which was nice and fortunate, knock on wood. But, hey, you got to do what you got to do. But I also realized that when I was testing for a year and a half, give or take, and I was doing good on the test. I was, you know, scoring high. But, you know, here I am about a year, year and a half into this. I had my EMT, I had my firefighter one at the academy at the college. I was almost done with my two year degree in fire technology. I'd already had my four year degree. I was taking tests as all one should be doing. But it was like one of those things that when everyone said, hey, the departments are hiring paramedics, you need to go to paramedic school because you're gonna take your odds from hundreds and thousands of people down to double digits. Seriously, if you become a paramedic when you test for a fire department anywhere in the country, most time it's less than a hundred candidates or competitors. Yeah, that's how many paramedics that are not out there. I mean, there's a lot of medics out there, but there's not a lot of them out there. So when I went to medic school or was applying for medic school, I realized, you know what? I can't continue to work full time because most medic schools are either Monday through Friday, eight to five, which means you don't work at all because it's, the, it, it's tough. Medic school is tougher than four years of college. I found a part-time medic school, which was two days a week, even just two days a week for eight hours a day. So that left five days a week to work, which I still worked at Long's. And I was done with my college, obviously, at that point. Two days a week in medic school, you think, well, that's I got five days left in the week to work. Okay. Medic school was tougher than four years of college. Let me repeat that. To me and to most people, paramedic school was tougher than four years of college. Yeah. There was 
so many relationship breakups during that paramedic school. I mean, for the time I was in paramedic school, I think there was like about 20 some of us that started this one paramedic program. Someone was telling me after they did the math and about half of those people, about a dozen people out of the 25 or so that started our medic program, resulted in basically relationship breakups, either divorces, separations, or whatever, because of the amount of work, time, and effort that goes into paramedic school that you have to commit. It's not just, okay, I took my two days, I'll see you next week. It's a lot of studying, a lot of other things you gotta do to stay engaged, to be prepared, to stay in the program. Not easy for anybody, but anyway, stepping back, I had to quit my full-time job. I had to walk into my manager, Long Shrugs. I think he still hated me to this day. Love the man dearly. He was a great mentor, but, you know, God rest his soul. I remember him, I was a manager of his, one of his five managers. And I remember I'm like, Mr. Lauren, I hate to do this to you, but I got to go back to part-time status. I'd like to go back from full-time management status, which I've been in for like four years as a manager, which, I mean, that was not easy becoming a manager. I had to bust my butt to get there, but that's not my career. This is a job. I want to be a firefighter. I told him, I go, I'd like to step back to have a flexible schedule. Um, it's going to be tough, but I'd like to only work a couple days a week. I'm having to move back home. That's stepping back as well, too, especially when I was living on my own, renting an apartment. You know, it's nice to be on your own, but now I got to move back in with mom and dad as much as I love them dearly. God rest their souls. Sometimes you got to do that. You know what? I'm willing to do that. So move back home. What took a sign? I took like a $20,000 a year pay cut. Now today, $20,000 may not be a lot of money to some, but back in 93, 92, when I did that, when you're only making 35,000 a year at the time and you take a $20,000 a year pay cut, now you're only making $15,000 a year. Yeah, I'm not paying rent anymore, but that's significant. And that definitely impacted my lifestyle, which you know what? Hey, you got to do what you got to do to get ahead. But I also wasn't looking at the short term. I was focusing on the future. meaning. I realized if I step back now a little bit, yeah, I'm going to lose some income. I'm going to lose a management position, which I could have had a career in, but I would probably not have been satisfied, but it was a job. But I'd be miserable for the next 30, 40 years. So I found my passion of firefighting, working in the fire service. And I'm like, you know what? I got to go for this. And I know some of you may not be able to do that because you have family commitments. I get it. There is no easy way to do that. You ain't going to tell your wife, hey, by the way, honey, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to go part time. And guess what? You got to go to work now. Oh, by the way, I know you're not working because you're caring for the kids, but you know what? I'll be stay at home father and you can go to work. Yeah, I can imagine how that conversation is going to go in most families. So sometimes when you're single, it's sometimes the best to get things done because you don't have the other um I guess challenges to deal with not that it's any easier being single or any more difficult but that was maybe what I had going for me but even if you are in a significant have a relationship with a significant other whether it's just a partner um, boyfriend girlfriend you know husband wife you know if that's what your career goal is to become a firefighter you better have that heart-to-heart -to -heart tough discussion with them and say hey you know what this is my career passion you know yeah I'm working here paying the bills but this is what I got to do. And I think that was the conversation that I would have had, obviously, if I had a girlfriend at the time or a wife that, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm making good money now, but you know what? Let's step back right now for the next year or two and focus in the future. Because if I can become hired, get hired as a firefighter, look at the job stability for the most part. I mean, it's hit or miss sometimes in job stability, depending on where you're at. But for the most part, job stability, decent pay, decent benefits, re decent retirement benefits in most parts of the country. Let's step back now to focus in the future because you know what? If, if you don't do that, you may never get there. But if you do do that and you're willing to look 5, 10, 20 years down the road, that's how you get ahead. But it, not, not everyone can do that. Um, I mentioned it's all about the interview. Yeah, most departments, 100% of your score is the oral interview, meaning that eight minutes <laughs> or 10 or 20 or 30 is that time that that oral board of two, three or four people typically are going to make that decision of whether, you know what, we like Steve. Or you know what, we don't like Steve. He's annoying as heck. You know what, have a nice day, Steve. Thanks for applying. You know, test with us next year, please. That's a lot of stress there for that poor oral board that's trying to make a critical decision because I know a lot of people can say, well, I don't, I'm not a good communicator. I don't sell myself well. I suck at interviews. Well, <laughs> You better figure out how to unsuck, how to figure out how to communicate, how to figure out how to connect and build a relationship with others, meaning that oral board panel, because you better leave that oral board room with them, them looking at you going, you know what, we want him, we want her. That's the person we want to have represent our department. 
And the sad part is most people leave oral interviews. I bet you probably 80% of candidates leave the oral interview wherever, whatever part of the country, probably 80% of candidates leave that room in oral boards. I've been on the oral boards go, going, OMG, that was painful. It, was that pain? Yeah, that was, was that pain? Yeah, that was painful. You know, that 10 minutes, that 20 minutes was painful because that person sucked. They couldn't communicate. They were boring. They were just unenthusiastic. They had no passion. And it was just like, can't this person just leave now? And that sucks because the oral board is not wanting to do that. We know you're nervous. Trust me, every oral board knows you're nervous because they were in your shoes at one point. Oral boards want you to be successful. Seriously, whether they got a frown on their face like some people do or a smile on their face, they want you to be successful. Why? Because they want to hire good people. I mean, they want to work with good people. They want to hire good people. It's, it's a great problem to have. But the problem is, like I said, 80% of candidates leave the room and it's like, OMG. Those 10 to 20% that leave the room, they're the ones that the panel goes, wow, I wanna work with that person. Or I think that person has potential. Wow, that person may be a future fire chief, a future captain, a future battalion chief, or even just a firefighter that's gonna be awesome. So some keys to success, your oral interview, a lot of passion, a lot of enthusiasm, obviously understand as much as you can about the job, but try your best to connect with the panel. It's the oral interview. I'm a fan of taking every test you qualify for. And you may go, well, I don't know how to, how do I find out what I qualify for? Well, like I said, 18 years old, high school diploma, most departments, start Googling that stuff. You got the internet in front of you. There's a good start. I encourage you to check out different testing companies that I'll share a little bit of information on in a little while, but there's testing companies out there that you pay them a monthly fee of like 10 bucks a month or whatever, and they'll send you to your email box, maybe to your text messages, to voicemails, to whatever, Facebook messages, however they're set up, they'll give you notifications on who is testing. But you gotta test if you wanna get a job. You don't test, you don't get a job. And you know what? I want you to test because you're gonna fail something. I failed my, one of my first, yeah, I failed a written test. Me? Yeah, I failed a written test, it sucked. It was miserable, I had a college degree and I failed a written test. And it wasn't about firefighting. Because if a department does not require firefighter one paramedic or even EMT, they can't test you on that stuff. Even if they do, they usually don't test you on that stuff. They usually test you on the basic written test stuff. Math, English, reading comprehension, um, maybe map reading, mechanical ability, basic stuff that you should have learned through high school or through your GED um, process or whatever, basic school stuff. The benefit of failing a test is that now you've seen the test and now you hopefully kick yourself in the butt to say, I ain't never gonna let that one happen. Or maybe it's your oral interview that you fail. You know what? Failing is not a bad thing. Failing is actually a good thing to all of us. It helps build character. And if we do what we can to learn from that failure, we'll never let it happen again. So I think that's that key to your success. But you're gonna see many in your life, not just for firefighter positions that just give up after a couple of times. Like, you know what, hey, those you know BS, they, they're not, they didn't want to hire me. Well, they probably didn't with an attitude like that. So take the tests out there, do your homework, do your research, I think are critical. And again, with the internet available, be careful of your sources, but there's a lot of good ways to do research. Um, one of the things I want to share another lesson quickly here. It ain't about you, but you know what? You got to take every test. Um, I was taking a test in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. They actually were one of the very few departments at the time in the 90s that required EMT, firefighter. They required EMT, firefighter one. They required a lot of requirements. And I was thinking, okay, there's probably going to be less than 100 people at this test. And they were going to hire a couple, I think two people. And I'm thinking, okay, there'll be less than 100 people. I walk into the room. It was a written test at a high school, which is common. The department hosts a written test. It's like usually at a big auditorium and they separate people. This is before social distancing was cool. They would separate people at tables and like, okay, Steve, you're at that table. Okay, next candidate, you're at that table. You're at that candidate, that table. And then for the next two, two and a half hours, you take the written test on your Scantron with your number two pencil and then you submit it. And if you get 70% or above, you get to go to the oral interviews. It's you know, pretty standard. Well, I remember it was like about 11 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and thank God I left early, but I left early. I got there plenty of time. So it's 11 o'clock, I remember the door shut, and I remember the assistant chief of this department starts welcoming everybody. Hey, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to test with our department. You know, 
this is a little history about our fire department. We're looking at hiring a couple of people. We know there's a lot of good people out there, but you know what, please be your best. And you know what, the best, the cream will rise to the top. You know, he's giving us a, you know, good um, pep talk and everything else. So he goes, all right, everyone ready to go? All right, start your written test when you're done. Please turn them in the front to one of our human resources specialists. Good luck, everybody. Okay, so there's seven of us. We're all taking our tests and everything else, A, B, C. And I remember all of a sudden, out of the corner of my ear, I hear this clink, clink, clink. And since I don't have my window next to me, you can't understand. But if you've ever heard someone use their keys to tap on glass, it's that distinct clink, 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 clink to get someone's attention. Well, this person was doing that a couple of times and, and I just sort of blew it off. And then after a couple of times hearing that, I look back and you can see a guy that was dressed up nicely. I mean, he was there to take the written test, obviously, but he was 15 minutes late. Well, he keeps on clinking on the glass there. And I'm like going, what's this guy? Oh, what a, oh God, you never want to be that person, that person. Well, here he was. You could tell he's stressed out. He's assistant chief, cool as a cucumber. He addresses the room. My apologies, everybody. Keep taking your written tests. Don't mind that individual. I apologize. I'm going to go talk to that individual. He's very professional about it. No attitude. I'm thinking to myself, probably like everybody else in the room is like, hey, this is BS here. We sh the seven of us actually showed, seven of us for like two jobs. Talk about great odds. We actually showed up here on time. It said show up early. We did. And nothing personal against the brotherhood or the sisterhood, but you know what? We followed instructions. Well, okay, everyone has excuses. Everyone, I get it. Things happen. But anyway, the chief was so cool. Talk about a good, solid leader. He opens up that door, loud enough for us to hear, but not loud enough for us to, I mean, to annoy us. But it, he, good morning, sir. How can I help you? I mean, it was a, totally a sarcastic response because, of course, we know why the guy was there. He was take the damn written test. But anyway, yes, good morning, sir. How can I help you? You know, and then of course this guy's huffing and puffing because he'd been running from his car wherever he parked it. Probably parked in the red fires on that front, hopefully not. But he's like, oh, oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Um, I'm here to take the written test. <sighs> yeah, I'm here to take the written test for your department. And I think all of us out of the corner of our eye, again, all seven of us, not hundreds of thousands, all seven of us are looking at what this chief's going to do because would have the chief have been nice if he threw this guy a bone and let him in? Yeah, but I'm sorry, that's BS. You know, it's nothing personal, but. We're the ones that followed instructions. But anyway, this chief was just like, I mean, talk about a leader. I still remember the chief goes, well, sir, I'm sorry, but our instructions on the paper that you have in your hand right now said the test started at 11. Nobody will be let in after the fact. We request that you arrive early, preferably no later than 1045, so we have a chance to let you in and get, start off with the instructions, but the doors will be shut at 11. And this guy, you could just tell he's getting pissed. Well, the chief smile on his face. I wish I could have videotaped this. And here's the chief going, I'm sorry, sir, but I've, and this was the part that I really hit home because I've got seven individuals here that can follow instructions. You know what? I wish you the best in your career. We'll probably be testing again in another year or two. Please take our test the next time we're testing, but thank you for applying with our department. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you and have a nice day. And that chief then just sort of kindly shut the door. And then this guy out, you could, he, he screamed something. I could tell he was pissed. I get it. I'd be pissed too. But the chief walked in up to the front as we're all just sort of looking at the corner by the chief goes, Hey, my apologies for that. But all of you showed up on time, followed instructions to me. You're the most important people here. So continue on with your test. Again, my apologies. That set the tone that, you know what, whether there's seven or 700 or 7,000, here's a chief that's willing to say, you know what, we want good people. Could that guy have been a good guy? Oh, yeah. We hired one individual that screwed up his time. He got lucky with the second time. He's been a great employee. So it can't happen. But you know what? Try to be those people that follow instructions because you never know when you're going to get a second chance. Or as they say, you never know when you get a second chance to make a first impression. So take every test. You may wonder right now, given the economy, given the challenges out there, why waste my time? Our fire department's even hiring. Well, unless you've been, unless you've been uh, in self-isolation for longer than say mid-March, um, you understand that there's a lot of things going on in the world, whether it's 
you know, the challenges with the coronavirus that hasn't, I mean, there is no vaccine yet. We're still dealing with the coronavirus. Will it spike up again in the fall? Is it flattening the, again, we don't know that. Then you look at the poor tragedy of um, George Floyd, Minneapolis, and all the other challenges, um, frustration that's come out of that with protesting and everything else. You, you, there's a lot of things going on in today's world. And I think the point is, is look at the coronavirus. This is hitting department budgets hard. There is probably not a city or county, state, federal, everybody from the federal government, us, our United States, down to our states, down to our counties, down to our cities, we're hit, getting hit hard with budgets. And you wonder why the budget's getting hit hard. Well, think about the coronavirus. There are cities right now, because of the businesses having to be closed because of sheltering in place, sales tax. Most cities rely on sales tax. Most cities rely on probably at least a half of their revenue. Revenue helps pay employees, helps pay benefits, helps provide city services. Over half to sometimes two thirds of a department or a city's revenue is sales tax. Well, guess what? There's no sales tax in a lot of these towns. That ain't coming in. Now, property tax, there's people that can't afford to pay their rents, their mortgages, whatever else. Well, some departments, some cities rely on property tax. So without those taxes coming in, there's going to come a point that cities cannot pay for their employees. And if you understand government, public safety in most communities, meaning police and fire, public safety is usually about three quarters, two thirds to three quarters. Think about that, 66 to about 75%, give or take in most communities, the budget goes to police and fire, public safety. So, and now think about this. Employees, city employees, county employees, state employees, of a bu city's budget, I'll just say city because that represents pretty much everyone's budget, of a city's budget, for example, over 90% of their budget goes to personnel costs, meaning wages, benefits, salaries, healthcare costs, retirement costs. So if you're city whatever, city of Oakland, city of Fresno, city of Las Vegas, you're already paying out 90% plus of your revenue that comes in into employee costs. I mean, that's just fact of life. So if you're not getting those revenues, it, it's got to affect the city in some capacity. And it's not like, well, we'll just hold on for another few months. Well, You can't just do that as a city. A city's got to balance the budget. A city's got to pay their employees, got to pay their retirement you know, benefits, got to pay their, their uh, healthcare benefits to employees. It's a very complex problem. When I, go, when I said earlier, do your research, do your research on becoming a firefighter, but also do your research on the jurisdiction you're applying for, the city itself, the county itself, the state, the United States itself. Understand economy, understand finances. I know those are unsexy topics, but you got to know what you're getting into. You know, one of the cities around the Bay Area here is looking at having to lay off some firefighters. I mean, you're going to see potentially some departments having to potentially lay off firefighters or just put a freeze on hiring for the next couple of years. That's a reality. I mean, especially when they're saying this economic downturn is even worse than the 2008, 2012 downturn about 12 years ago that you may or may not remember. This is supposedly worse than the depression back in 1929. Okay, wow. And again, you may say, I don't give a crap about that. I just want to come. I know you don't give a crap about this, but you got to give a crap about this. So I'm the, remember, I'm the glass half full guy, not the glass half empty guy here. We are still seeing people retire. Retirements are still happening in departments across the country. Um, departments still have to replace some people. Yeah, a department here may be laying off some firefighters. Yeah, the department over here may be not hiring any firefighters for the next couple of years. But the department next door may have just had like 10 retirements and they got to they got to replace them. So that's the challenging part is you can't throw in the towel right now saying, well, no one's hiring. Screw it. Well, if anything, now is the time to be looking for a job. The problem is the time to be looking for a job is not the last few years when the economy was doing great because that was actually a good time to be looking for a job because there was not a lot of competitors. Now, with so many people out of work, the competition is going to be high. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but you got a lot of competition competitors out there, especially a lot of good professional people that may be even firefighters or other departments. Again, not trying to be negative, but just know what you're getting into. The jobs are out there, but it may not be your local city. You may have been born and raised in the city of Seattle. Well, that'd be nice if you get to work in your hometown of Seattle, if that's where you want to, you know, you grow up in and you want to stay there. 
but very few people ever get hired in the same city they grew up in or the city they live in. You know, some of them maybe next door, maybe 20 minutes away with or without traffic, so like Bay Area, yeah. Some people have to move out of state. Some people have to move a couple hours away to get the job. That's what you gotta look at. Are you willing to move to get the job? If you're single, not a lot of ties, maybe pretty easy to do, but there's jobs out there. You gotta do your homework and know what you're getting into. So just talking about some stuff. Yeah, retirement promotions are still occurring. People are still leaving departments. Um, there are some cities out there that are getting their butts kicked economy-wise, meaning revenue-wise, meaning, if you Google fire departments and finances and budgets, which you should be doing, especially for the departments you're applying for, you, there's, some, there's a lot of cities, counties, and states that are really hurting. So you may think they're not going to hire at all. Well, if they have mass people leaving for whatever reason, meaning they're leaving early retirement or maybe because they want to get to better departments, they may need to hire. So that's happening, but you got to keep your nose on the grindstone and be out there. Yeah, budgets are going to be, but budgets have always been tough. When I was testing in the early 90s, I remember hear, hearing people say, hey, budgets are tough, or, you know, budgets are like a roller coaster. Sometimes you have good years, bad years, which is the cycle of life and the economy. Budgets are always going to be tough. They're never going to be in our favor. So our key is just trying to be able to just realize that money is always going to be tight. Because think about it, I mentioned it earlier, most cities, Three quarters of their revenue is from taxes. Three quarters, if not more. Sales tax, people need to buy things. Property taxes, people hopefully need to buy things, buy property as well as pay their mortgages and everything else. If there's hotels, restaurants, because maybe there's a stadium in your city, and then obviously there are all the hotels that are there and bars and restaurants. Hey, look at the city. You know, If the city's not getting those revenues, times are tough, and it all trickles down. No city ever wants to lay off people. I don't know if any city, a fire chief, police chief, city manager, city council. I don't know of anybody that true. Yeah, again, I'm positive. Maybe I'm naive. Nobody wants to lay anybody off, especially after you put a lot of money in to hire them. But again, drastic measures may be required and it sucks. But again, you, you can't let, you can't be bitter given the current times because it's going to show in your oral interview and it'll show in your score or lack thereof. So know what you're getting into. You may hear a term called safer grant. Safer grants are federal grants that um, have been around for maybe 15, 20 years, where the federal government provides money for fire departments, especially those that have been destroyed budget-wise, um, to be able to hire firefighters. Um, it used to be a two-year grant, and I think it's a three-year grant now, but there, I mean, there's some departments. If you go back to 2008, 2009, 2010, big city fire departments, especially in the Midwest and in the South, that were decimated. I mean, multiple firehouses being closed, firefighters being laid off, uh, positions being eliminated, not just in the fire department, but police department, fire department, public works, parks and rec, everything decimated because the cities are going bankrupt. Well, safer grant positions were a way for a fire department to, you know, hey, we shut down three firehouses, but maybe this is a way for us to get our legs back and hire some people because we can't afford to hire as it is. Well, be cautious because the department Google Safer Grant. You're going to see it's all public information of all these departments around the country that are awarded Safer Grants, meaning like the city of Detroit was awarded a Safer Grant, X amount of millions of dollars so they could hire X amount of firefighters. Well, the good news is, is you got a job for two to three years because that's the money that's coming in from the federal government. Again, nobody wants to hire you to lay you off or to fire you. That's not our, no department wants to do that. But again, they may have to. So if you do take a Safer Grant position, You'll know that going up front, so they say that in the announcement. Hey, it's great experience. The hope is that the economy turns around in a couple of years, and at that point, you'll be a, the city will have money, because that's usually the hope is that, okay, the federal government floats it for a couple of years, and then, hey, city, you better come up with money, and you better hope the sales taxes are there, the property taxes, or whatever. So most of the time, Safer Grant employees do get to stay on because the budgets get better, but you know what? Sometimes they get laid off at the end of the three years because the money isn't there. But here's the good point for you. People go, why the hell would I take a job for two or three years knowing I'm going to get laid off in three years? Well, you got to look at the big picture strategy, not task, strategy, big picture. You get hired on a safer grant. You're getting paid the same as a firefighter that gets hired without the safer grant. Same pay, same benefits, same title, same uniform. I could be on the job five years 
before the Safer Grant, just hired because the city had money. You could be one of the Safer Grant employees that got hired. We look the same. Nobody knows the difference. So if you do get laid off, okay, that sucks, but now you got some time on the job experience wise. And now think about it. You're going to an oral interview. Oral interview panels are looking for ways to connect, meaning they're looking for what people they want to get hired with. You come to an oral interview saying, hey, I was hired on the Safer Grant with, say, whatever fire department here. I got laid off alongside of 30 other people because the department and the city didn't have the money to continue the grant, the positions to make them actual positions. I got laid off and I'm trying to provide for my family. I come to you offering three years of experience, blah, blah, blah. That oral board is going to, as long as you're a good person with great personality and great character traits, they're going to have a lot of sympathy for you because they know, hey, you can already do the job because, hey, you already passed the academy, you passed probation, and you've been on the job. It wasn't your fault you were laid off. So a lot of times you'll get probably sympathy points from oral boards. And don't take that negatively, but you know what? You should get sympathy points. But again, you can't come in there being a jackass and think you're a know-it-all, like, hey, I got laid off, you owe me the job here. No. If you've got that type of attitude to begin with, you're probably not the best person for probably a lot of fire departments, just, just to say. So good positive character traits go a long way. Talked about locating fire service jobs. A lot of ways to do it. I'll just, without spending a lot of time, last item there, testing notification services. The internet's good. Don't get me wrong. But you're going to be spending hours and hours on the internet by just Googling firefighter job, firefighter employment, who's hiring firefighters. You can do that. I get that. But to me, the best way and the fastest way, no fast track, but fast way to find out who's testing is services out there. There's many services out there. I think the best one is firecareers.com. I don't get paid for endorsing them. I still pay for a subscription to firecareers.com, not because I want to leave my department. I enjoy and I love my department. I do it because I want to stay abreast of who's testing out there. I want to stay abreast of what the, what the departments are requiring, things I've mentioned already. Because I teach the college, I'm sharing information here. I want to provide the most up-to-date information because I don't, I don't ever want to forget where I came from, as sometimes happens to people. But I want to stay in the now and in the know and be able to share information. But again, if I'm your instructor of the college or if you, you know, we stay in touch after this, you can't rely on me for all the jobs. Hey, Steve, I live in Oklahoma. Who's testing? I don't know. Do some research, dude. Well, again, the benefit of services that are out there, and like I said, there's others. Google search them. For 10 bucks a month, they do the work for you. They're the ones, this and many other companies, that'll be out there. Nationwide jobs. There's hundreds of jobs they'll be sharing at any given point, and they'll give you a notification of, hey, on June 7th, the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, will be opening up Firefighter. The requirements are high school diploma, EMT, 18 years old. They open up on the 7th and they close on July 1st. I don't know. So, wow, okay. Then you can go then you can go to the city of Tulsa website. Okay, you know, and you got to be able to, again, a full-time job, getting the job. You got to be doing some homework and some research. But money like this to me is well spent because they do most of the work for you. You still got to apply. You still got to do your homework. But services like this are worth their money in gold. And like I said, I think it's a valuable service that I subscribed to before I even became a firefighter. There's also some other companies. For those of you that are in California, there's a company, organization, FCTC, Fire Candidate Training Center, online.org. They host a statewide written test in California, as well as a statewide CPAP, well, CPAP that's good nationwide. So there's two facilities up north, Sacramento and Livermore, Northern California, then two of them down south, I believe San Diego and um, Orange County, just south of LA. If you're in California, well, most departments require you to have a CPAP physical ability card, meaning you took the CPAP, which most fire departments don't give you a physical ability test. They say, hey, go find a CPAP somewhere. So FCTC online, you can see CPAT offerings throughout the state of California, also valuable. Even if you live, well, I live in Maine, I'm not gonna be in California, or I live in New Hampshire. But guess what? There's probably a lot of good information on how to become a firefighter that you can still find on that website, even if you never wanna work in California. But if you do wanna work in California, here's a way to find some CPATs. Also the statewide written test. They offer a written test that's good. A lot of departments use that written test, use that list. So it's a way to have access to many different departments. because Think about this, of those 50 plus tests that I took, not 
all of those were say for one department, meaning city of San Francisco, one test, city of Fresno, a second test, city of Salt Lake City, a third test. Some of those cities or tests were actually for multiple cities up north of myself in San Jose where I live, um, San Mateo County. It's just south of San Francisco, north of San Jose. San Mateo County used to do like a 13, 14 fire department, because there's a lot of small fire departments, 13 or 14 fire departments would do like an annual test, meaning once a year, they would host a written test, and then they would host a physical test before CPATs were out there. And then they would do a joint interview, it, meaning I could take this one test, and then from there, all the 13, 14, how many departments were participating could then pick and choose who they wanted, saying, hey, we're hiring three people, give us 40 names, 50 names, 100 names, so we can interview them and decide who we want to hire. To me, as a candidate, that was awesome because I could take one test, not 13 different tests. And that's the benefit of taking like an FCTC, especially if you want to work in California, live in California, is because now many departments in California will use FCTC because they'll say, hey, FCTC, we want to hire firefighters. So give me the names of anyone that's passed your test with at least 70%. And you don't have to be a firefighter necessarily. You don't have to be a firefighter to take the test. Go to their website, check it out. NTN or National Testing Network, the other website, um, nationaltestingnetwork.com is a nationwide, national, nationwide type of service. Go to their website, you'll see there's probably 400 plus departments that use them for testing. My department used to use them, now we're using FCTC. We may go back, we may do both. Some departments do both in California. But anyway, meaning if you want to work for a certain department, you have to take their written test and they offer like a written test um, an online version of a written test different locations and then from there so it's it's a great way to have access to multiple departments that's money well spent so check those out to broaden your horizon because i'd rather take one test to have a chance to work for 20 departments or hell a couple hundred departments than just one test for one department <coughs> excuse me do you have what it takes to become a firefighter well a lot of people think they could do the job but until you've really been in an academy to understand what the job entails of, because, yeah, riding on, riding on Big Red, as they say, a red fire engine, oh, that's cool and bitching. But it's, it's not just riding on Big Red. Yeah, most of our calls are medical calls. Yeah, most of our calls are medical calls. Three quarters, give or take, in most departments. Very few calls are fire calls. But we still have to fight fire on occasion. We do a lot of different things as firefighters. My three key questions for you to ponder. Do you have what it takes to become a firefighter? I think that's critical and you I don't know you better know yourself what are they looking for in firefighter applicants and then lastly why do you want to be a firefighter so think about those three key things um, the only way you truly know if you have what it takes to become a firefighter well there's a couple ways start taking tests and you may say well all the departments in my area want EMT and I'm not an EMT well guess what <laughs> If you want to work in your area and they all require EMT, you better find an EMT program somewhere. That's, I mean, you don't know until you try. Or all the departments require a paramedic or a fire academy. Well, guess what? Find a fire academy, find a paramedic program. That's one way. But even if departments don't require those things, you don't truly know until you get in a recruit academy. That's why I think it's beneficial to go to a college fire program that has a fire academy and that gives you the fire science classes. Like I mentioned earlier, fire behavior, building construction, very critical things, firefighter safety, because that's how you start learning about what it takes to be a firefighter. And it's not probably all you think it is. Everyone, everyone always thinks a job is easy until they actually have to do the darn job. You know, I don't, yeah. Number two, what are they looking for in firefighter applicants? I've, I've hit on a lot of those things. We're looking for good quality people with good solid character traits, people that we want to have join our family. That's it. Who do I want to work with for 24 hours at a time, 48 hours at a time, 72 hours at a time? Who's not going to drive me crazy? Who's going to just be that rock star, not too quiet, not too overly spastic, just that person that's just a good person that plays nicely in the sandbox with others? Because you know what? When that bell goes off, we have to work and function as a team. More importantly, we also have to be able to go out there and solve the public's problem. When Mr. or Mrs. Smith calls 911, it's the worst day of their life. And we better be their A team that comes out there to solve their problem, or at least helps them solve their problem by maybe helping pass the problem off. Not pass the problem off, but for example, if someone's having a heart attack, we can only do so much basic life support and advanced life support with our EMTs and our paramedics. They got to get to a hospital at some point. So then at some point, passing them off means 
getting them to the ambulance, getting them to the hospital for definitive care. But again, good people that don't cause problems. Why do you wanna be a firefighter? That's gotta come from your heart. There is no good reason. What comes from your heart is the best reason. So if you watch the other webinars I've done, you'll see a little bit more discussion on some of those items as well. You know, instead, as I hit on, we should be hiring for attitude and character, positive attitude and positive character traits. You know, I heard this from someone a long time ago, and I can't remember who, but so I can't credit them, but you know, it's like, it was a pretty blunt statement. They said, we can train, train most, not everyone. We can train most to throw ladders, pull hose, don an SCBA, meaning the skills. We can train most, we can't train everyone. There are some people that obviously may not have the physical strength, the aptitude, I don't know what it is. Not everyone can probably do any, any job for that matter. But anyway, we can train most. However, we can't train you to be nice. Now I'm bridging on the attitude and character above. We can't train you to be nice. That's something that should have been instilled with you years ago. We can't train you to have a good positive attitude. We can't train you not to be an asshole. I mean, those are innate traits that you grew up with that were built upon you, whether it was your family, your friends, your interactions. We all have those friends that are that, those types of folks. They don't have an edit switch. Usually they're just a jackass. And think about that. When the bell goes off at the firehouse, we don't need people like that at the firehouse or providing service to the community because we need people that are there for the right reasons, good positive character, good positive attitude and character traits. So that's what the oral board is looking for as well as the fire departments. Unfortunately, most fire departments don't hire that. They usually hire for training and skills. It's not their problem. It's not their fault. Sometimes it's because of numbers. A lot of smaller departments, especially smaller departments that can't afford to get hundreds or thousands of applicants through the process, that's why some departments say, hey, we want to have someone that's been a volunteer. We want some, someone that's you know got their firefighter one from a college or another department. We want someone with experience from another department because maybe they can't afford to put you through an academy or they, they want to put you right on a fire engine because they have a spot because someone retired. I get that. And they can't afford to do a lot of training. I get that. They're hiring you for your training and skills, but most departments hopefully are hiring for attitude and character. Don't believe me? Look at the challenge our law enforcement professionals, our brothers and sisters are dealing with around the country right now. Public safety, law and fire are very similar when it comes to Budgets, depend, you know, we rely on them, they rely on us and everything else. I bet you right now, if you asked a lot of citizens, a lot of individuals, a lot of people around the country right now, who should be getting hired? I think the honor, answer is pretty obvious. I mean, you can train people on a lot of skills, but a lot of it comes down to attitude, character, and positive behavior. That's what we should be hiring for it. But you say, well, we should. Yeah, the problem is there's not a lot of those people out there that can get through all the processes of a hiring process. So, I mean, and there's a lot of good people that just don't want to be firefighters. I get that, or don't think they can become firefighters, and that's the challenge. So be that person. We can train you. Don't get me wrong. It's good to have those things like go through a college and get the experience, but it doesn't mean that we can't train you. We had a sign that we used to share in our academy wall and our recruit academy is we don't test character, we, re we reveal it. What that means is that you were good enough to get through the oral board, to get through the backgrounds, the psychological evaluations, the medical examination, the chief's interview. You went from the thousands down to the top 15 to start the academy. Well, now you're in the academy with everyone else. You got to go through the four month academy and then like a year of probationary period. You're put in stressful situations. You're put in team environments, and that's sometimes what happens. That's why sometimes you see people that get fired during the recruit academy or get fired during a probationary period for your department. Yeah, just because you get in the academy doesn't mean you're in like Flint. You still got to get through the academy. You still got to get through the probationary period. And if you still do something stupid after probation, you still can be held accountable. It doesn't mean you can't get disciplined, but especially during a probationary period in your academy period. So Again, this, this is where we reveal characters during your academy because we're putting you through stressful situations. Not, not necessarily on purpose or not to be mean, but the job is stressful. So we're, that's where usually stress brings out character, as you can tell by some of the tragic things we're dealing with right now in the country. And it's usually not the good character most of the time. Uh, minimum requires from a firefighter. I've hit on all these things in most departments. You, you do the homework. You know, when you start subscribing it, um, 
uh, testing notification services or Googling becoming a firefighter, you'll see probably these are the most common requirements. Again, you don't see a four-year degree, a two-year degree, because most departments don't do that because they'd be eliminating a lot of, eliminating a lot of their comp competition. They're, they're, the goal is not to, and the goal is to weed out, but not weed out that much. So I want to segue a little bit here about networking and building relationships. Obviously, if we were a group of people and it'd be a lot easier to, to uh, have a conversation in person, it'd be a lot easier to have that discussion, but I'm going to work through this right here. So the word networking to me really means just, it's not sucking up, kissing up to others. It's building, building relationships, finding people to have a good relationship with, and then building those and maintaining relationships. for the whole sake of hopefully finding others that'll help you out and that you can help them out in the process too. So I mentioned earlier that it's critical to visit firehouses, meet firefighters. And if you haven't done that yet, go down to your local firehouse, knock on the door, bring them a nice dessert. Hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm interested in becoming a firefighter. Can I have a few minutes of your time? Most of the time they're gonna say, sure, come on in. Of course, grabbing your whatever it is, cookies, pie, who knows what it was that you were nice enough to bring, but you didn't have to, but it's a nice gesture. Um, they come in and you have a good positive attitude, you're dressed appropriately, and you've got a smile on your face, asking them for career advice. More than likely that crew at that firehouse is gonna probably give you some of their valuable time and help you out. And that's networking. It's not a one and done. It's a long-term big picture thing. You're stopping by your firehouse. Let's say you live in whatever city. You live in the city of Denver, and you live right across the street from Denver Fire Station Number Two. Okay, where's the best place to start? Fire Station Number Two, because it's right across the street. Get to know those firefighters. And if you haven't figured out by now, there's not just one group of people doesn't live there 24/7, 365. I mean, we're there for 24/7, 367. 24 7 365 but there's usually multiple work groups as i mentioned called shifts or platoons or groups with different numbers usually there's three or four sometimes different groups of people that usually rotate being there every day or every couple of days well that's the key is just because you met firehouse number two today say a platoon well if you go back in a couple of days maybe it's c platoon on duty or d platoon or b as in bravo different groups of people Maybe some similar people because someone's working overtime because someone called in sick or someone's working a trade. But that's the key is start networking by your local firehouse. Start finding other firehouses in your community. Let's say there's a firehouse on the way to your grandma's house or the way to your parents' house or the way to a friend's house when you're traveling around. You got some spare time and you got, well, I got 30 minutes to spare here. Hey, how you doing? My name's Steve Prusbrowski. Um, Right now, I'm interested in becoming a firefighter. Um, I've just started out my process of researching fire departments. I've gone to your website, or maybe you didn't go to the website, but can I maybe spare you for maybe 15, 20 minutes of your time to learn how to become a firefighter for whatever fire department this is? Pick your brain a little bit, get some advice. And again, most of the time they're gonna say, come on in. And then again, maybe they have to go, or maybe, hey, we only got 10 minutes because we gotta go leave for training in 10 minutes, but 10 minutes is better than nothing. And then maybe at the end of the 10 minutes, hey, I. I know you guys got to go drill. Any problem with me maybe coming back in the future at another time so I can have maybe more time to talk with you? Again, what are they going to say? No, most of the time it's going to be like, well, hey, here's my business card. Call me up, email me, and we'll set up another more formal time. Hey, maybe you can even do a ride along. You know, maybe you can spend some time at the firehouse. Planting the seeds is what networking is. And it's not just one and done because you want to meet people in different firehouses, different shifts, different departments. Family members, that's why it's critical to let your family members and your friends know that you're testing to become a firefighter because maybe your grandma or your aunt or your buddy or your buddy's buddy or your sister's friend of a friend who knows you want to become a firefighter, you happen to run into them one day at a whatever event and they're like, hey, you want, you, you want to be a firefighter, don't you? Well, my brother or my sister or my mother or my father or my buddy. And then next thing you know, it's like, hey, they work over at whatever department. Okay. Can you connect me with them? Sure. I've yet to meet a firefighter that doesn't want to help somebody become a firefighter. Some are more happier and more positive than others, but we were all in your shoes at some point. So get out there. Networking 101, just some bullet points. Obviously making contacts with people that can help you, but it's not a, this is not all about you. 
This is a two-way street here. You know, making contacts with personnel of all ranks. When I was testing to become a firefighter, even before I tested to become a firefighter, I knew I wanted to become a firefighter since the time I was a little kid. Because I wanted to be a firefighter since I was a little kid going through elementary school, junior high school, high school, there was a handful of people. My parents didn't work in the fire service. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. I, really, you know, I didn't have any relatives in the job. Didn't need to. But my dad, my mom, family members, friends were all looking out for me going, hey, Steve, so-and-so works for Oakland. So-and-so works for San Francisco. Go call them up. You know, so that's how you got you to gotta network because all these people, if they like you and they see some promise, they're going to be, hey, go talk to so-and-so or go, hey, so-and-so's testing, you know, or give you suggestions. Um, you got to be able to talk about self, yourself. I touched on oral communications of how valuable and critical that is earlier. If you've never heard the term elevator speech, elevator speech, Google that. You got to have an elevator speech, which is pretty much a very quick down and dirty description, which I'm forgetting right now, go figure, of um, what you want to share with them. Because when you stop by a firehouse or meet a firefighter or a fire chief, and then one of the first questions they're going to probably ask you is, so, hey, nice to meet you. Why do you want to be a firefighter? And then, of course, uh, to help people and give back, serve my community. Hey, all good answers. Don't get me wrong. All good answers. But they're not going to get you an A or a B on the oral interview. They're going to get you a C. Huh? Isn't helping people and giving back and paying it forward and serving my community all good? Yeah, it's all good stuff. That's all 70% C-rated passing answers. When, how's, well, okay, here's my point. When the oral board is seeing double digits of people or hundreds of people or God forbid thousands of people and then they're asking that question in there, why do you be a firefighter? And they're hearing every candidate, same type of answer. I want to help people and give back. Oh. It gets old quick. The first person gets the best score. Everybody else after that is like, oh my God, here comes somebody else wanting to be a firefighter for the exact same freaking reason. Now, take away the job, the career of firefighter. regardless of your career, regardless of where you're at. Shouldn't every human being want to give back to their community? Shouldn't every human being want to volunteer, pay it forward in whatever it is? Shouldn't every human being want to be a good person? Yeah, those are all good humanistic traits, good person, people traits. As for why you want to be a firefighter, I think the best way to answer that question, to make sure you're unique, you're different, and you stand out, what the heck got you to sign up for this webinar besides the words free? Hopefully it was more than just free that got you to do this. Something sparked your interest. Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a situation, maybe it was an experience. Maybe it was something you encountered, whatever that was. Something made you say, I'm gonna go for this. Maybe, maybe it was me, I don't know what it is. If you answer your oral board question of, why do you want to be a firefighter with that unique story coming from your heart and your brain? That's going to make you sound unique. And, and that's, that's the people that stand out. The 10%, the 20% oral boards, the ones that are unique, also passionate, enthusiastic, good character traits, good people traits, but also that are unique. So find out what's driving you to do this. And, you know, don't get me wrong. You want to serve the community and all that other good stuff, but you got to be able to talk about yourself. If you're not comfortable talking to a group of others, get comfortable. Take oral, oral, oral interview classes. Yeah, take oral interview classes. Take speech classes where you have to give speeches in front of others. Do that. Because the oral board, here you are across the table. I'm assuming once social distancing is done with. But anyway, you're across the table with two, three, four, five people. I don't know. And they're all like looking at you. Mad dogging you. It's, that can be nerve wracking. Even though they want you to succeed, it can be nerve wracking. So you got to be able to, you know, have that smile on your face and thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Let me take a few minutes to explain why I want to be a firefighter for your department. So you got to be able to talk, talk about yourself um, and also ask questions of other. Hey, what do you like about the Los Angeles Fire Department? What do you like about the San Diego Fire Department? Do people that work there that you meet up with? Or what do you dislike about the San Diego Fire Department? I mean, because it, you want to hear the good and the not so good about the organization, the agency. One person may be bitter and miserable. That's, that happens in every department. But if you hear 20 people all say, at 20 at different firehouses at different times, all saying, oh, this department, this city sucks because of this reason here, 
that should be a red flag. I'm not saying don't take the job, but there should be a red flag. And then you better be Googling that stuff. And say, Are these just 20 better people? Well, maybe 20 out of 5,000 could be better. But yeah, figure that out, but be able to talk about yourself. It's critical. Um, and networking obviously is making, it's building relationships with others. How to network, you already started, you're here hopefully. Now you don't know who else is on here obviously, but this is a good start. That's another benefit of taking college classes for fire because you get a chance to network with other like-minded individuals. Um, good way to do it. Visiting firehouses, obviously. Taking tests. I mean, you take a test in the city of Portland, Oregon, let's say, is hosting a written examination. Let's say they're allowing 3,000 people to the written test. It's at the auditorium, the Portland auditorium, whatever they call the arena. Yeah, the basketball arena. They've got tables all over the floor. Yeah. That's how it happens sometimes in big cities. They take the basketball or hockey arena, space out the tables, and they cram a couple thousand people in the morning, a couple thousand people in the afternoon. Then, of course, the next day is a couple thousand in the morning, a couple thousand in the afternoon. Intimidating. But again, it's you against yourself, not you against them. But anyway, it's a great chance to network when you're beforehand or afterward. Not, don't, not during the test. Don't talk during the test because they tell you, don't do that stuff. But you don't want to get bounced from your test. But hey, my name's Steve. Where are you from? You know, how long you've been testing. That's your way to network because these are the same people, especially those if you're taking classes at the college, those are the ones you're going to run into as time goes by. Um, talk about visiting firehouses. Visiting firehouses is an art. I mean, if you go to my website, uh, chanelfire.com, click the free stuff. I actually have some articles I've written on etiquette for visiting firehouses because you don't want to, you don't want to go there. I mean, looking at me with a fire department t-shirt on, if I'm not in fire department uniform, yeah, I'm in fire department t-shirt and shorts or my concert t-shirts. Yeah, sorry, I'm old school, but that's me. I'm enjoyable. Um, I probably would not wear my Slayer t-shirt. Yeah, one of a couple in the shirt there or my Metallica shirt or even just an ACDC shirt to a fire station visit. I mean, not to say you couldn't and you'd probably, hey, cool, Slayer rocks, Slayer rules, dude, Slayer. There may be some that appreciate that, the firehouse, but again, you never know who your audience is. So because you never know who your audience is at a firehouse, they may be loving it, but you don't, you just want to be professional. So you want to look appropriate. So dress appropriately. Um, let your family, friends and family members know about becoming a firefighter. I hit on that. Um, why is it important to build, to, to network and build relationships? It's simple. Because those that are successful in life in anything that we do, anything in life, success does not come easy. For most people, when you see someone, whether they're the CEO of a corporation or they're the president or they're the whatever it is, I don't care if it's a big private industry company, public government, a sports team, a lot of it is hard work. That is true. To get you where you're at, very few get handed the silver spoon. Some do, I get it, but that's probably the very few. Most people, it's hard work, um, busting your butt, networking and re building relationships with others because someone may have to make a choice and well, I got three people to pick from, why should I pick you versus you or you? And if you're all equal, then maybe it's flipping the coin, but it's like, a lot of times it's not equal. It's like, okay, and someone goes, well, we'll hire that person because they got, they got a four-year degree and that person doesn't have a degree and that person just has a two-year degree. Well, just because you got the four-year degree doesn't make you better than anybody else. I, okay, and nothing personal. I got a four-year degree, but it doesn't make me any better. Education is important. Learned a lot of skills, but I don't know if I'd hire someone or promote someone just because of the college degree. Oh, they've been a firefighter for Chicago Fire for 20 years, so I'll hire them here in San Francisco. Okay, they probably got a lot of awesome experience in Chicago, but I mean, are they any better than the next person that has zero experience? I mean, this is why it comes down to people skills. So, and making positive working relationships with others. Also, relationships can help you gain and achieve respect, which again is critical. You may not realize it now, but think in the long term of the job, um, especially if you ever want to become a captain, a battalion chief, a deputy chief, a fire chief at some point in your career, or just get promoted in any job you work at. A lot of times it's about your relationships, not kissing ass, not sucking up, but just having good, solid working relationships. Because think about it. If you're a boss, let's say you're the boss. You want to promote somebody or hire someone that's going to be a thorn in your freaking side? Well, they're good, they're good at the skills. They're, they're, they're trained. They're dialed. They're great at the skills. Okay. 
Think back to that other slide, character traits versus training and skills. Yeah, they kick ass on the training and the skills part, but if they're always a pain in the butt because they're always whining, complaining, filing grievances, oh no, I'm gonna threaten you with a lawsuit, or I'm gonna quit if you do that, boss, or I don't wanna do that. So yeah, I know, you know, it's social distancing, I'm not gonna wear a mask, you know, screw the rules. Well, I'm sorry, I mean, Think about it. You're the boss. What do you want? You want high maintenance or low maintenance? You probably want low maintenance. Hopefully not yes people, but hopefully low maintenance. Um, that oral board, again, that oral board in that short amount of time is trying to find a connection between you and them. Obviously, they want someone that can do the job, play nicely with others in the sandbox, that can be good representation or representatives of their community, their fire department, everything else, because no one wants to hire anybody that's going to be the Facebook poster child or the internet poster child because of the stupid things that they did. Nobody ever wants to do that, trust me. Finding a way for them to like you. So I think that's key is relationships is, because if someone likes you, they're gonna wanna spend time with you and give to you and help you versus if you're a jerk, they're not gonna wanna give you the time of day. You know, we all know the saying that you can bust your butt and do 10 awesome things, but all it takes sometimes is one stupid thing, whether you said it, whether you wrote it out or whether you did it, or well, I didn't mean it, didn't matter. You said it, you did it, you wrote it. That one mistake that you did just wrecked every good deed that you just did. People don't care about everything in the past. Now they're going to focus on that one thing. And that's why it's so critical about building relationships um, because you never know when you get a second, you don't always get a second chance in life. Building relationships, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, I had somebody reach out to me recently, um, which I appreciate, I'm glad. I'm very fortunate to have people that I've never even met before. Sometimes in social media, we're connected, um, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And someone's like, hey, Chief, I got a question for you. You know, and this one guy the other day, he goes, you know, he goes, I, I, he had to have something posted. He, he's one of those people that has to post something on social media like five times a day but he's an aspiring firefighter. And he has a lot of followers, he said, that are chiefs and captains and fire service professionals. And he's like, chief, um, I, I'm getting itchy to post something, but then I'm not sure, he, and he shared a post that he was gonna post, that he wanted to post. He goes, what are your thoughts on this post here? I go, oh, I go, that's, I don't know if I'd post that if I were you. I go, it, it may not, we live in a very controversial, divisive time for whatever reason. It just sucks. It's we. I mean, you see it now, and some blame politics, some blame other things. I don't know what it is. I don't know the cause of it. I don't know whatever. I mean, you form your own opinions. That's your choice. But we live in a very divisive world, um, and it's this guy was like, "Go." I go, "Listen, dude." I go, there, "You posting this right now could there's a ch chance that you could piss off some people, piss off people that may make some negative comments." or may not even say anything at all. And just because someone doesn't like it or doesn't comment on it, doesn't mean that they don't think differently of you. And he goes, well, if I don't post anything, then people are gonna look, what are they gonna think of me? I'm like, dude, newsflash. You could probably go, I don't care how many followers or friends or people or whatever else you have on social media. And don't get me wrong, some people don't wanna be on social media at all, and that's fine too. There's nothing wrong with that either. But I think social media can be very beneficial if used the right way especially as an informational tool, to make, but make sure you try to sift out what the relevant and real stuff is. This guy felt like he had to be posting something. I go, dude, you could probably go a week without posting anything. And in all honesty, no one's going to give a crap. And he's like, well, I go, your, if your ego is that big where you think that you've got to, people are going to give a shit about you not posting something, sorry. Now, you may get some friends that are truly friends that may reach out and say, hey, dude, you okay? You haven't posted in a week or so. I mean, are you alive? Can I help you with anything? Which is a good buddy check mechanism because we got to worry about that stuff too. But in all honesty, people are so freaking busy in today's world. I don't know of anyone that isn't busy. Honestly, people are busy. People are overwhelmed. There's too much information out there. It's a good problem to have, but no one's going to give a crap, dude, if you don't post anything. And now today's world, you run the risk that if you do post something, uh, potentially dividing people even more. And if you're wanting to become a firefighter or even you are a firefighter, it, it, it's tough because yeah, you make these people like you because, oh yeah, all these likes and hey, great job. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. Then you get all these people over here that just said, you know what? That was inappropriate. That was offensive. You shouldn't have posted that. You can't win for losing. 
or no good deed goes unpunished, as sometimes the saying goes. So you know what? Especially in your shoes right now, it's good to have social media, but I'd be very cautious about what you're posting or not posting. And you know what? Because departments today are looking at that type of stuff in your background investigation. And you can't tell me that there aren't departments that are saying, oh, look at their Facebook page, look at their Instagram page, or just Google yourself. When's the last time you've Googled yourself and see some stuff that comes out? I mean, I try to do it regularly just to make sure there's nothing inappropriate. I, I don't think I do anything inappropriate, but you never know what somebody else did on my behalf. Oh. So do that type of stuff because that's the type of stuff that people are going to look at and that could cost you a job in the fire service or even god forbid once you're on the job that could cost you a job i mean i know you have the right to free speech but there's also saying that yeah you have the right to free speech but your employer also has a right to discipline you for inappropriate speech that they feel is inappropriate and you can we can debate that all day long but you know what your employer is going to probably win the battle yeah you can take them to court you can try to sue them but in the court of public opinion today, as soon as that stuff hits the media, social media, the internet, man. So walk the walk, talk the talk. I think be professional. If, you're, if your gut's telling you, I don't know about posting or not, don't even save it as draft. Because if you save it as draft, you're on the risk of accidentally hitting post. And then you're like, oh, crap, I got to delete it. I go delete. And we know nothing gets deleted 100%. So be out there. It's a great tool, but also be very careful. Talked about respect is earned. It's a two-way street. Take responsibility for your actions and non-actions. Um, and even if your accounts are private, you may say, well, my Facebook account is private. My social media is all private. But when you do a background investigation for most departments, one of the questions they're going to ask you is, hey, by the way, can we look at your, nope, I don't want you to see my Facebook account. Well, okay, now you're raising red flags. So just, Prep for that stuff now. Be prepared for that stuff now. Be that person that someone can open up with, I think. Um, be a good conversationalist. Be someone that I, people can talk to. I mean, I'm an introvert by nature. You may not realize that. I'm not an extrovert. I enjoy being around people and I enjoy doing things like groups of people, but I'm also an introvert. So amazingly, in this time and age, there's a lot of people going, oh my God, three months of self-quarantine. Okay, I'm working from home part of the time. I'm in the office part of the time. Okay, yeah, I miss seeing some friends. I miss going to, you know, teaching across the country and I miss, you know, doing fun things, going to baseball games, sporting events and traveling, but you know what? Not the end of the world, you know. But again, that's just me and I'm not I'm not questioning you, but be someone at least someone that people can talk to. Some other things, be a good listener, don't judge people. I mean, if you really look at it, this is just common sense 101 for anything in life today. Be a good listener. Take advantage of positive opportunities. When you have somebody mention to you, especially as you're trying to build and maintain relationships, someone throws you a bone that, hey, I hear the city of whatever, Boise, Idaho is testing. And you're like, I live in Salt Lake City. That's a, I don't know, three hour drive away. I don't want to work in Boise. Well, if you live in Idaho, there's probably not a lot of fire departments that are paid, meaning nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with volunteer accommodation departments but if you want to be a career firefighter you got limited options in certain states especially certain states that don't have a lot of population because it's mostly volunteer fire departments so depending on where you live you may have to drive a few hours or move out of state or go where the jobs are but no reason to pass up an opportunity to test when you know apply what's the worst thing that can happen offer you the job periodically maintain contact. I think that's one of the good things for me during this, um, during the coronavirus situation last couple months. It's, it's been good for me because I'm, I'm busy like, like everybody else is. I'm not making an excuse out of it, but it's forced me in a good way, I think, to try to reach out with folks that I haven't talked to in a long time. Now, then I also realize after a while, there's probably some folks that there's a reason I haven't probably reached out to them and talked because maybe they haven't reached out to me. Maybe there's no mutual connection there or relationship, but it's like, okay, whatever, because but I'll take the high road and try to do the right thing. And that's why I said, I try to reach out to people I haven't touched base with in a while. Not to try to get anything out of them, just to try to say hi, see how they're doing. Is there anything I can do for me? And hey, maybe hopefully I'll pass across. And if nothing else, hey, don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of assistance to you or your family, okay? Um, Two-way street, follow up and follow through are critical. If you have a mentor or network key or someone that you've been working with, like a firefighter you met or at a firehouse or someone you've been in contact with, and they throw you a bone like, hey, go take the test for the city of 
Eugene, Oregon. Hey, you know what? Go take the test. I mean, you may not qualify for it. You may not be able to make it work in your schedule, but take the test. And then afterward, hey, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to take the Eugene test because of whatever reason. Or I took the test, I'm on number, I'm number 3,500 on the list. <laughs> Great. Probably aren't going to get higher, but you know what? Hey, follow through with that to keep in touch because if someone's taking the time to build a relationship with you, they actually probably want to communicate with you. And if they don't, you'll realize it probably pretty quickly. But definitely worth it over the long run. So as we're winding this process down here, just uh, one thing I'll share. I remember testing for a department about stretching the truth on the resume. I mentioned earlier that when you're starting out and you got a blank resume, it can be very intimidating as you're going, man, I got nothing on my resume. And even if the department just, all they require is 18 years old, high school diploma and GED, and that's it. That's all they require, like some departments. It still can be intimidating because you go, man, I've never been to college or I don't have a degree or I don't have my EMT or my medic or volunteer time or paid time or explorer time or whatever time. Okay. Don't worry about what you don't have. Again, glass half full, not half empty. Don't worry about what you don't have. Worry about what you have. Instead of saying, well, I don't, I'm not an explorer. I'm not, excuse me, I'm not a volunteer. Hmm, I'm not this, I'm not that. What do you think the oral board's doing? They're going, well, hell, if he's not that or she's not that, why are we wasting our time? Versus, this is what I have done. And if you've graduated high school or got a GED and are 18 years old and you've at least held one job, even if that job was a paper out, you're, some of you are probably going, paper, what the heck's that? Yeah, sorry, old school job, Google that. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. Is I'd rather have you have the deer in the headlight look with me on a webinar, I can't see you, than you being at a firehouse, maybe interviewing the firefighters, or even as a probationary firefighter, doing the deer in the headlight look of, uh, what do you mean by uh, that comment? Which, there's a lot of comments, because remember, who are you going to be working with? You're going to be working with people on the job that are anywhere from, say, 18, maybe into their 60s multiple generations of people. And the last thing you want to do is say, what do you mean by that? Because I mean, you, you may be thrown a term that was used maybe in your grandparents era or your parents era, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't understand the term. Just like they shouldn't, should understand your terms. They don't look at you like, what are you talking about? I mean, it is what it is. But anyway, I was worried about not having enough to test for a department and it bit me, and it bit me hard. I mean, not, not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but on my resume, I put, a lot of departments at the time were looking for bilingual candidates. And I remember on my resume, I didn't put I was fluent, because I didn't want to lie. I didn't say I was fluent in Spanish, but I put on there Spanish language, conversational level of understanding or something like that. So I wasn't fluent, but I had a conversational level. Really, my conversational level is una mas cerveza, por favor. One more beer, please. Or don't, I can't even say where's the bathroom right now, sorry. Um, the funny part is, is like I put that on my resume. I wasn't saying I was fluent, but I remember one of the oral board members for a department, he made the comment to me, my second question, the first question in an oral board is usually, what have you done to prepare yourself? Or how have you prepared yourself? The icebreaker, the opening statement. I was so nervous in that interview, which again, we know you're nervous, but here I was in that interview and one of the ringers asks me a question in a foreign language. I found out I was Spanish. Well, I look at him during the headlight, look again, you don't want to be that person. I go, excuse me, sir. I go, I don't understand. I go, you just asked me a question. I didn't understand the language you were sharing it in. And he goes, well, I asked you in Spanish, are you nervous right now? And I remember I had a deer in the headlight look, my deer in the headlight look was even bigger. And I'm like, um, uh, I'm nervous right now, but why would you ask me that in Spanish? That, that's, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, that's totally inappropriate. That's illegal. You can't ask me a question in Spanish. Well, he goes, well, in your resume here, it says you have a conversational level of Spanish. And what I asked you in Spanish, if you truly had a conversational level of understanding of Spanish, you would have nailed that question. At that point, I'm like, mic drop, I'm done. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get out to my car and get the heck out of Dodge. But I still had like seven, eight oral board questions. That was probably the most oral, miserable oral interview I had because he's sitting there smiling because he knows he got me. And you may go, well, that BS. He shouldn't be trying to, you know, you know, that's entrapment. He shouldn't try, you know, he shouldn't have tried to 
you know, put you in that position. No, I shouldn't have put myself in that position. I should have just left it off. Thank God I didn't put fluent, but I still conversational is stretching the truth. It was one of those things that I shouldn't have done. And I was trying to fill every line of real estate on that resume. And I was like, you know what? Shouldn't have done it. But anyway, about the only oral interview I ever failed. And for good reason. You know, I never took that department's test again. It was a good lesson learned that if it goes in my resume, I better be able to back it up. Now, flip side. Let's say he had asked me that question and I immediately shot back in Spanish, nailing it. What do you think that would have done? Had I nailed it, not being sarcastic, but with a smile on my face saying, well, but whatever, he probably would have immediately smiled on his face, probably said nothing else. The other two panel members probably been like, holy crap, what was that? And my interview probably would have been awesome for the rest of it because, again, I would have nailed it. He called my bluff, and you know what? He won. So don't be that position. Don't feel inadequate. Don't be that one that comes in, well, I don't have this, I don't have that. No, this is what I have. Whether it's just a paper route for the last 10 years or maybe in today's world, I mean, hell, maybe a sell. I remember that guy, all he's ever done is sell stuff on eBay. That's his resume for the last five years. You know, he started selling stuff when he was 13 on eBay or whatever age you can do it. So what? It's a job, right? What have you learned with selling stuff? You've learned marketing skills. You've learned financial skills. You've learned website-related skills and a heck of a lot more. So you know what? Focus on what you do have. And I think that's the key there. And sometimes it is who you know. And I don't say that. Don't think you have to have a relative, family member, or friend to get hired. But sometimes it does come down to who you know. Meaning, when you start visiting firehouses, the, one of the benefits besides meeting firefighters and getting great information most of the time from them, especially those that really appreciate the position you're in because they never forgot where they came from, you never know who may be on your oral board. I mean, I visited so many firehouses when I was testing for being a firefighter that it was not uncommon after a while, you know, you visit a firehouse today and then maybe two weeks later, you have, you have an interview. And when you walk in that interview panel, here you are, and you go, wait a second, Captain Jones, pleasure to see you again. And that was the same Captain Jones that you met at station three on your fire station visit. Now, it can go both ways, don't get me wrong. Firehouse visits are not golden, they don't guarantee you the job, they can actually go against you because if you come into that firehouse visit like a know-it-all, arrogant, with an attitude, entitled, and all those other negative character traits, they're gonna check out at you right away and they'll probably remember you because of the way you were. Like I said, oh, that was that guy that wore a Slayer shirt to the interview, I mean, to the uh, firehouse visit. Now, some guys may think that's cool, but for an, that could also, what if the person was offended by that um, band? Yeah, yeah, so you never know. You're taking a risk when you put yourself out there, but you know what? Sometimes, let's say you had an awesome relationship at the firehouse visit, and then next thing you know, on the oral board, it's like, Captain Jones, great to see you again. And you know what? He or she may remember you from that firehouse visit. May, you know, I remember that person came by. They came by, they were dressed professionally. They had a great positive attitude. They really wanted to work here for whatever reasons. They were someone that I'd love to have on my crew. I'm going to, you know what? I mean, they know you more than everybody else, maybe just because of your one hour firehouse visit. But you know what? That may make the difference. That's why it's critical. You never, you know, besides, getting information is you may find people that have been on past oral interviews or that will be on future oral interviews. So take the time to do that, but also understand you run the risk. So other fire service career opportunities. Um, granted, most departments, 90% plus of our positions are all called sworn positions, meaning folks that wear a badge, people that are like firefighters, engineers, captains, all the way up to fire chiefs. But 10% of lesser departments also have administrative staff or support staff. There may be jobs such as mechanics that are, they're not firefighters, but they still work for the fire department wearing maybe a uniform, like our mechanics wear uniforms still, but they're not, they don't wear the badge because they wear overalls, but the badge still, I mean, they still have patches on the side of the overalls. Yeah, I mean, they're not firefighters, but they're darn good mechanics at what they do, but they have a foot in the door. We had one of our mechanics, did, did that job for a couple of years, and then took the firefighter test a couple of years later, got hired. Well, you hired him because he was a mechanic? No. That was not all of it. We hired him. Yeah, it didn't hurt that he was a mechanic, but we also knew of him. For the last couple of years, he did an awesome job as a mechanic. People got along with him. He was always nice to people. He was always that extra get this done and help people out. He had a great attitude. That's why he got hired. Plus, he was already road tested. 
doesn't mean you have to do that, but there are opportunities out there. Um, we hired somebody as a firefighter that was a secretary, but what we call administrative assistant. This individual came as, came in as an administrative assistant. And you're like, huh? They wanted to be a firefighter and that was their foot in the door. They did that job for a year or two until we tested. They took the oral interview. We already knew the individual. It's like, you know what? Hey, well, to take a chance and then let's put them in the academy. They passed the academy, passed probation, good employee. So there may be dispatching positions in your communication center that are usually, again, these are usually not firefighters, but they're foot in the door. Or they may be awesome careers that maybe you never become a firefighter, but they're still good jobs, good pay, good benefits. A lot of fire prevention possession positions, such as inspectors, investigators, um, can also be found. And again, maybe it's a foot in the door, maybe it's just an awesome career. Public education positions. So a lot of opportunities if you do some searching. Um, besides my two entry-level preparation book, here's the promotional preparation book. So when you find yourself at that point getting ready to promote, um, also put that one together as well as the other ones I'm working on as well that are at the publisher as we speak. But more importantly, here's all my contact information. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm on social media. Please feel free to connect with me, reach out to me. Here, my website, my cell phone, my email address. I'm a resource. Please don't hesitate to use me as such. Um, I'll be happy to hang around a little bit for questions and answers. And if something comes to you after the fact, please feel free to email me, text me, call me afterward. Um, as long as there's no technical difficulties, Hopefully I'll be posting this on YouTube later on today, if not early tomorrow, early tomorrow morning, so you can watch it in little bits and pieces if you care or share it with others or whatever else, or see the others that I've missed as well. So that email will go out probably tomorrow afternoon. So if you haven't heard anything from me by tomorrow night and you want to get a copy of the presentation, just go to my YouTube channel with my name or feel free to email me and I'll make sure that happens if you didn't get it. So if you have any feedback, I'm all ears. If you have any ideas for future seminars, future webinars, I'm all ears. Feel free to share it now. Feel free to share it in private later on. I don't care. I do this stuff because I'm very fortunate to. So I thank you very much for the gift of your time, whether it's now or in the future as you're watching again. It ain't easy, but there's jobs out there. There's careers out there to be had. And if you give up, you give up the badge of somebody else. So hopefully some of my passion and enthusiasm winds off on all of you and uh, allows you to get into the career of your dreams. So thank you very much, everybody. And like I said, I'll hang out for a little bit. If there's any Q and A. Thank you, Ashley, you're welcome. Thank you as well to you too. Appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'll turn off the recording here. Take care. Hopefully I'll pass across again at some point in the future. All right. Be safe out there and be well.